You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a better player than a robot. Just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it. And I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the sixth part of What If Deku Finds Venom Symbiote in MHA. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of Ultimate Demon B65 and somebody on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the authors too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. All for one stood in front of various computer screens within the League of Villains warehouse, monitoring data and surveillance footage from across Japan and beyond while making sure to carefully and articulately analyze and read the data given to him through one of his quirks. Shigaraki meanwhile had been giving out orders to his subordinates within the League, ensuring that they not only had resources but also to keep an eye on any loose ends. However, the leader of the League of Villains looked over to his master, wondering more and more about his plans and the mysterious benefactor that he had made a bargain with. Feeling brave enough, Shigaraki approached all for one and bowed to him. Why do you bow before me, Tamura? You are the leader of the League of Villains now and must articulate yourself that way. It's only a matter of time before we become equals. All for one said, before looking at his student. Apologies, master, Shigaraki said before standing up straight. I had wanted to ask you this ever since that night you returned from your fight with All Might. Then ask away. All for one said. Who is this benefactor of yours? What do they want and why do they need you for it? You said they needed to be set free when speaking to Overhaul. What did you mean by that? Shigaraki asked his master. I suppose I should explain a few things to you, Tamura. For should anything happen to me then it most likely will fall upon you to uphold this pact. All for one said as he began to explain. You see, that fateful night in Kamino was meant to be the night of my defeat, where All Might would use the embers of one for all to lay down a deciding blow, one that could very well have landed me in Tartarus. But instead, someone intervened, pulled me into their domain, preventing my capture and introducing me to our benefactor. A few months ago, Null's domain. I am the living abyss. I existed before this reality and shall exist long after I slumbered in the colorless void until light invaded my kingdom and drove me out of my rightful place in the never-ending cosmos. I am the forger of darkness, the king in black I am. No. All for one stared at the pale humanoid figure with long wavy hair and red demonic eyes that identified itself as Null. He felt a powerful sensation radiating off Null in the domain around him. Pure primal dread, fear and entropy falling on the symbol of evil like a waterfall. All for one however maintained his composure as he addressed the king in black. The king in black I heard those words inside my head during the fight with all might. Was that you're doing too? You called out to me therefore I called out to you. And it allowed me to bring you into my domain the domain of a god and all replied. Glaring at all for one. Yes, I suppose you are a god. Having lived before the universe and being the creator of the symbiotes all for one remarked. And if you are their creator, then perhaps you could share with me their history, their biology, what makes them tick and how to shape them into the perfect weapon. So is that what you desire? To usurp my dark throne, become the new king in black? Null asked, as he bent over and sat on a large black throne he manifested from his own shadow. Oh no, I do not seek godhood, rather I seek to become the perfect antithesis to all things good, to crush the hero's vision of a better and peaceful future, and I will do whatever it takes, including using your creations and mine to create an army of evil that will devastate my world. All for one explained, you wish to become evil itself. Interesting maybe you are the one I seek Null said as he placed his closed hand against one of his cheeks. When the celestials and their light sprung into my kingdom, infecting it with life and hope, I created a living weapon from my shadow and beheaded one of their interlopers, creating a forge from their skull and spark that allowed me to create more of my symbiotic abominations. The clinter all for one said. Clinter what a disgusting phrase it might as well be what you could call this domain of mine a cage created by my deceitful kin. Null roared angrily, his voice echoing across his domain and increased its intensity. I was betrayed, my plans to reclaim the multiverse for myself ruined by symbiotes whose hosts taught them compassion honor and freedom. They buried me in my existence, ensuring that their future can never know of their origins and their mission. The heroes in my universe, they wanted to do the same to me, reduce me to nothing but a ghost story, an urban legend used to frighten petty criminals and law enforcement. But I endured, I seized as much power as I could obtain, and even when death's door was right around the corner, I refused its call and kept going, 
Even if I had to rely on machines and drugs to preserve my ailing body, all for one explained, what you seek, O King in Black, is a way out, to be free of this prison so you can reclaim what is rightfully yours. I can help make that happen. You would set me free knowing the level of destruction and despair I can unleash upon creation. And for what? My knowledge and wisdom regarding my symbiotes. No asked. Not only that, but I can also provide you with an army, one that is fully obedient without a trace of free will. A union between symbiotes and Namu, engineered with quirks to enhance their pre-existing abilities as well as purge them of their vulnerabilities. Just imagine it. No, ravaging the cosmos with the ultimate army of perfect invincible killing machines that no planet or galaxy could ever overcome. All for one spoke, explaining his idea to the king in black, to which Null thought for a minute before a sinister gaping grin formed across his face. Human, you will come to regret your decision, but very well. I will pass on my knowledge to you, and in exchange you must set me free. And how, pray tell, do I set you free? All for one asked. Null extended his hands out and used his power to manifest what looked like a black dragon. Before I used the forge to create my symbiotes, I took my shadow and blood and created the dragons I would use to decimate entire worlds and devour their life forms. Of the many I created, none were as mighty or as merciless as the Grendel. The Grendel they were a giant in Germanic folklore, who battled Beowulf in the Old English poem of the same name. All for one remarked, I assume this Grendel is detrimental to your freedom. Though my true body is trapped here, I can manifest within my creations that are still enthralled by my will, and the Grendel, being one of my first, is a perfect candidate. Fortunately, it came to your world long ago to ravage it, but your kind somehow sealed it away, putting the Grendel in an eternal slumber. Null explained, interesting, and so then what would happen if the Grendel is awakened? You would be able to manifest from them and use Grendel's body to break your true body out of this prison. All for one asked, precisely but are you truly certain of your decision? Null asked, if freeing you allows me to ensure that hero society fails, then by all means, Null, let loose the apocalypse. All for one replied with a grin, then I will send you back to your allies so you can begin but first, allow me to enlighten you Null said as he extended his arm forward and then with a sadistic grin plunged his index finger into all for one's face. All for one audibly growled and huffed at the sensation of pain that went around his face, not to mention felt his blood dripped from the open wound. Null cackled mildly before moving his index finger in a circular motion which went inwards more and more. All while all for one tried maintaining his composure as more blood seeped out of his face. Null then pulled his finger out, in which the release forced all for one onto his knees, allowing more blood to fall from his face. All for one puffed and panted as he felt the freshly made wound start to close up, and when he lifted his head up, the symbol of evil saw his reflection, and in it a scar on his face which resembled a pale red spiral. The pact is sealed rise, all for one return to your planet, find the Grendel and set me free Null commanded and created a pitch black portal behind all for one, who stood up and was then enveloped by the portal, which soon disappeared. After I was pulled into the portal, my outfit and life support systems were transformed into what you see now. The mark he etched onto my face granted me his knowledge and a power boost, however it is also the seal of my bargain, and I must complete the task Null gave me in order to be free of his grip. All for one explained to Shigaraki. Master why would you make a deal like that, knowing that it would mean serving someone else? Shigaraki asked, surprised and shocked by all for one's story and decision. Much like how Overhaul sacrificed his plans for eradicating quirks to remain alive, I chose to seize the opportunity to obtain cosmic knowledge and a greater understanding of the symbiotes, even though it would cost my freedom. But it's hardly slavery, my goals are to destroy the future after all, and should Null be set free, then it will guarantee that this accursed world is destroyed, just as you intended, Tamura all for one explained, forming a grin. I yes, I suppose that the League of Villains do wish to see the end of this damn society. This hopeless world I will follow your lead, master, whatever you choose, I will do so as well, Shigaraki declared. Now not so fast, Tamura, though I ask you to respect my decisions and not interfere with my plans, I encourage you to take charge of your subordinates and ensure that your plans remain intact. All for one assured. Are you sure, master? Tamura asked. Do what you need to do, my apprentice, it's all anyone can do at this stage. All for one said as he continued his work, while Shigaraki then left to continue his own plans. If the master is willing to placate to the whims of this null, then he must have a plan to ensure his survival. I just hope that he chooses to enact it before it's too late. The sun was setting upon Tokyo as a young female student was supposedly walking back home. 
The uniform was composed of a white undershirt, a black skirt and black shoes with white shoes though the most distinct feature was the navy blue cap with a black front brim, orange trimming a gold badge with an S insignia on it. This girl was from Shikesu High School, a hero school with a similar level of prestige and standards akin to UA. Hi, albeit with a lot less media coverage primarily due to most of the top pro heroes in the country being alumni of UA. Hi, however, not everything was as it seemed, for there was a muddy substance slowly dripping and falling off the girl as her phone started to ring. As she went to pick up her phone, more and more of the muddy substance fell off of her and revealed that she was in fact the blood-sucking shapeshifter, Himiko Toga. It's about time you picked up. Where are you right now? Mr. Compress said irritatingly. Toga, I had the most wonderful fun today. Toga replied with glee. Yeah well, fun for you maybe, but I sure as hell didn't have fun couldn't kill anyone or rip them to shreds. Carnage whined. Zip it, you had your fun earlier, this was my time to have fun, my way. Toga said to the psychotic symbiote. Still not getting along it seems anyway, don't get so lost in your role that you slip up. Mr. Compress stated. There's too much at stake to get caught. I've never been caught in my life. Not even close. Toga remarked before holding a few vials in front of her. And my mission was a success. Tamura is going to be so happy. I managed to get some of Izuku's yummy blood. And a few extra of course. And with my strength and speed enhancements, no doubt. Carnage said with a snarky tone. Nice work. Guess I was worried for no reason. Mr. Compress remarked on the other end. And what about your other task? Do you have your targets? Of course, I'm already headed towards one now, I'll call you back once I'm done. Toga replied, putting away the vials. Very well, tread carefully and don't give your targets a chance to fight back. Mr. Compress advised before hanging up on his end. Alright, time for a little deter Toga said with a grin. So, how do you intend to exploit my power now? Carnage asked. Borrowing, not exploiting. Toga argued. Oh really? So when did you ask me if you could use it then? Carnage countered. In case you've forgotten, you're basically my bloodstream now, what's yours is also mine. Toga said, starting to get annoyed by the blood hunter. Then I suppose that the blood you collected is also mine too, huh? Carnage asked her host. Nope, that's for my quirk, something you don't have. Toga replied with a mischievous grin. I can shapeshift too, you know. Carnage exclaimed in a pouty tone. Not into people like I can. Toga said as she took out a vial that was separate from the others she collected at the provisional license exam. I should have enough of that Kami girl's blood to transform into her again. Fantastic. I was hoping you'd turn into that millennial trash again. Can't wait to hear your best slang and dank memes. Playa. Carnage said sarcastically. What century were you born in? Millennials don't exist anymore. That's like my great-great-grandma's generation. Toga said with a laugh. I forget that this universe isn't in the 21st century like my own. Carnage pouted. Universe. I thought you and Venom were aliens. Toga said, confused. We're aliens just not interstellar ones. I mean I was born here and part of your bloodstream, so technically I'm from here. But my old man and Brock aren't Carnage said awkwardly. Oh, and when were you going to tell me about this? Toga asked with a frustrated huff. Knowing that my kind was from another planet is more believable than my shitty dad being from another universe. Besides, that stupid night symbiote is from your universe, so I'm not technically lying, am I? Carnage explained sheepishly. I'm not dumb you know. I know about other universes. Toga said, crossing her arms. Alright, then explain how the multiverse works. Carnage challenged her host. Well, every universe is just a copy of another universe, where things happen differently, where we made different choices. Toga explained, trying her best to sound smart. Wow, everything you just said is complete horseshit. The many worlds hypothesis, really. You pick the most basic theory out of them all, given that it's similar to branching paths on a timeline. Carnage said, mockingly. Give me a break, you stupid tapeworm. I'm not some quantum physics expert. Toga exclaimed. Wait, how do you even know about that many worlds thingy? The same way my old man got thrown into your universe, the symbiote hive mind. It contains billions of years of shared knowledge across the multiverse, which our kind can access in order to learn something from our kind's history and experiences. Carnage explained. But concentrating on it is hella boring and would fry your brain if I showed you it. Noted we're getting off track. Time to suit up and take out our first target. And if you're lucky, you can eat them. Toga said with a grin, before taking out the vial of blood belonging to the Shikesu student, Kami Utsushimi. Ooh, now you're speaking my language Carnage said with a sadistic tone. Toga drank the vial containing Utsushimi's blood and quickly took off her clothes as a wet clay-like substance formed around her body and molded itself into a feminine shape. 
After a minute or so, Toga was covered in a lifelike outer layer or shell made from carbon and nutrients provided by the ingested blood that resembled Utsushimi, giving herself her physique, height, weight and features such as her long fawn-colored hair and brown eyes. Perfect, Toga said using Utsushimi's voice. I knew it altered your physique and looks, but your voice box changes too. Carnage asked, intrigued. The benefits of DNA I guess, Toga said as she put on Atsushimi's uniform and decided to keep moving. Now then, my first target should be nearby. Toga, under Atsushimi's appearance, voice and name, headed out of the alleyways and into a nearby district, which had a few shops and vendors around. Toga looked carefully at the people there, scanning them in order to identify her victim. Where are you? Toga thought to herself as she kept looking. I can just tell you where they are if you like. Carnage offered impatiently. Don't tell me, I like the thrill of the hunt. Toga responded. Fine by me. Carnage said with a huff. I know you're here somewhere, my little gazelle, and I'm the big bad game hunter. Eager to cut you up and snag me a trophy Toga said to herself as she continued to scan her surroundings and search for her target. A few minutes passed and Toga locked her eyes onto her target. The target was a student from Shikesu High School much like Utsushimi based on their uniform. They were a tall and well-built young man with buzzed, dark brown hair and black eyes. He was in a Sayurashi, who possessed great power and skill with his wind quirk, Whirlwind, making him a possible future threat to the League of Villains. Bingo Toga said with a smile as she then started to approach Urashi as Utsushimi. Yo, how's it hanging, Urashi? HM. Okami, okay, there you are. Didn't Nagamasa say you weren't feeling well? Urashi asked with an energetic but confused tone. Yes well, I was feeling under the weather if you feel what I'm saying. But no sweat, I just needed a quick pit stop. Toga replied, trying to mimic the mannerisms of Utsushimi. Wow, cringe alert carnage remarked inside of Toga's mind. Well, good to know you're feeling better. You upperclassmen have done so much for me since I came to Shikesu. Urashi said, pumping his fists up. Right, of course, anything for a first year Toga said, trying to keep her facade up. So Urashi, could I talk to you for a sec? Away from this crowd. Huh? What's up, Kami? Is everything okay? Urashi asked with a concerned look. I think it's best if we went somewhere more private Toga replied with a sly grin before winking at Urashi. Urashi's face went slightly red as steam poured from his head. Oh sure lead the way. Simp. Carnage commented with disgust. Toga then led Urashi away from the increasing crowd and towards a nearby alleyway. Toga grinned and internally laughed, playing the first-year student for a fool with feminine charms. Urashi wondered what Atsushimi wanted to talk about, given the suggestive nature of her wink and tone, though simply followed the second-year student into the alleyway. Toga checked to see if they had been followed or if anyone could see them, however they were hidden by trash and a dumpster nearby, giving the two the privacy she needed to complete her mission. This looks private enough, wouldn't you agree, Urashi? Toga asked, using a seductive tone this time that made Urashi's face go even more red. Why why yes, it most definitely is, Kami. Urashi replied in his usual hot-blooded manner. Toga giggled before turning to face Urashi. All right then, ready to talk. Absolutely, Urashi replied. Good boy, Toga said as she placed a hand on Urashi's shoulder, who looked back at who he assumed was his senior student with a nervous grin. Toga's smile and radiant stare under Utsushimi's face then morphed into a blank and cold one. Do it. Before Urashi had any time to process what Toga had said, a red and black tendril protruded out of her arm and pierced through his neck, spraying blood onto the nearby wall. Urashi's eyes widened upon realizing what had happened, and tried to scream, only to choke on his own blood and coughed violently. What's that? I can't hear you over the sound of your jugular being ripped open and filling your throat up with nice, fresh blood Toga said with a giggle. Finally, we get to kill someone, especially this hot-blooded wind-slinging buffoon. Carnage exclaimed as she slowly started to take Urashi's blood. I'll admit that under normal circumstances, there's no way in hell I would be able to take you on directly. That wind quirk of yours is too strong. That's why I needed to think smart, and by using my quirk with a little bit of acting and stroking your teenage hormones, I can kill you without you ever lifting a finger against me in silence you so can't call for help. Toga explained as the carbon-based substance around her body started to fall off, revealing her true appearance alongside Carnage's biomass enveloping the arm on Urashi's shoulder. Oh, what's wrong, Urashi? Did you have a crush on dear old Kami? You did, didn't you? Aw, oh, that's too bad given that you'll never see her again. Actually Toga said as she pulled out what looked like a lock of fawn-colored hair, which made Urashi's eyes widen even more in horror. No one will ever see her again. Carnage then started to form over Toga, enveloping her face until it morphed into her own, 
creating more fear and tension between the blood hunter and slowly dying Shaiksu student. If it means anything to you, big guy, she begged for her life and the lives of her classmates Carnage said as her smile widened with bloodlust, before clamping down on Yurashi's head and bit it off with one gulp. Yurashi's lifeless and now headless body fell to the ground in a pool of his own blood, while Carnage licked her lips clean of brain matter and bone fragments before retracted back into Toga, who now held a vial of Yurashi's blood. Good riddance Toga said as she picked up her phone and dialed Mr. Compress number. Hey Atsuhiro, you'll never guess what just happened. If you're calling me, then I presume that Inasai Yurashi is dead. Mr. Compress asked on the other end. Yep, man, it was too easy. Teenage boys really do only have girls on their mind. Not that I can judge given my fascination with Achako and Izuku. Toga said with a gleeful smile. His brain was pretty juicy for such a big guy, but also quite tender as it went down my throat carnage commented, protruding out of Toga's body again. Peaky Mr. Compress said in a somber tone. But that is one of our future problems disposed of. And there's plenty more to take out, more heroes and training to snuff out. Shigaraki added on the other hand. Awa, Tamura, were you listening the whole time? Toga asked in a playful tone. It doesn't matter, come back to the warehouse for now. Killing one of Shikesu's students is going to bite us in the ass if they discover his body, and you along with it. Shigaraki said. All right, I'll be there a SAP, boss. Ta-ta, Toga said before hanging up. So what now, Toga? Heading back to HQ, Carnage asked with a snarky tone. Well if I don't want to be caught, then yes I am. Toga replied as she started to carefully slip away from the scene. Come on, we could transform and kill and eat more people through your tactics. Carnage pouted. I didn't stay a free girl by making dumb decisions. Carnage, we'll have another chance to kill and eat later. Toga explained with an annoyed tone. Also, you're welcome. Huh? Carnage said, confused. I let you eat someone today when I could have just killed them and left their body there for the cops to find. Toga replied. So you should be grateful. Grateful. I let you use my powers to do your little mission and yet I'm the one who has to be grateful to you. Carnage asked in disbelief. Exactly. Toga replied with a sly grin. You're a weirdo, you know that. Carnage asked. Whatever do you mean? I'm just a cute little girl who likes stabbing people and drinking their blood. Toga replied before entering the nearby train station. Fantastic Carnage said sarcastically as they boarded the train. Eddie and Venom had been stuck doing chores for the past few days at the Night Eye Agency, and though meeting and speaking to Tagata helped to make their experience doing bearable, the two were restless and frustrated at the fact that they were confined to this building unless they went out to go shopping or get food. Eddie and Venom were currently on their lunch break, having picked up some takeout from a nearby shop while also making sure to feed Venom his daily dose of phenethylamine. This fucking blows. Venom roared angrily. That future sighted four eyes has had us do nothing but chores. We're supposed to be on the null case too. But we haven't heard anything from Sleeper and Night Eye won't even let us exercise Eddie said, trying to remain calm. Why do we have to listen to him? He's just some nerd obsessed with all might and humor, except he has no sense of humor whatsoever. Venom shouted. I mean he can see the future and predict people's movements. Eddie added. Only when he touches them and gives them direct eye contact. He can't predict us if we beat him up before he lands a punch. Venom exclaimed. He would have heard you by now if he wasn't on patrol with Mirio. Eddie said in annoyance. I'm just bored, Eddie. I miss being out there, fighting and eating and doing what a lethal protector is meant to be doing. Venom said, lifting his head up higher. Yeah well, until we hear something, we're stuck here, pal. Eddie said with a sigh. Suddenly, Eddie and Venom heard a mechanical sound coming from outside, immediately catching the two's attention. They stood up and went to go and check out the source of the commotion, and to their surprise they saw a bizarre-looking vehicle in front of the building, made from a dark metallic substance with green lightning around it. What the hell is that thing? Eddie wondered. It's a spaceship, Eddie. Venom replied. A spaceship, Eddie said before realizing something. Wait, if that's here then. Edward Brock, Venom. A familiar voice said, to which the lethal protector duo turned in the direction of said voice. Sleeper, man I am glad to see you. Venom exclaimed. I have alerted Sir Night Eye. They have been informed of your transfer over to me. Sleeper said, before opening up his ship. Get in. Uh, okay then. Eddie said as he boarded Sleeper's ship. Welcome to the One Eros. Sleeper said as Eddie sat down on one of the ship's seats. So this is your spaceship, huh? Venom asked. It's not just a spaceship, it's a customized Zandarian metamorphic siege cruiser. Sleeper replied, fully malleable and programmed to shift and alter its density and shape to adapt to a planet's personal gravity. Yeah, I don't exactly know what that means, but it sounds cool. Eddie said sheepishly, so where are we headed, space cop? 
Venom asked, to hunt down a group of mercenaries that were tasked with ensuring Null's freedom. Sleeper replied as he sat down, activated the ship and took off. Fortunately the seed Eddie and Venom were on automatically formed a harness around his body to prevent him from being thrown around. Wait, run that by me again. Mercenaries who are trying to free Null, Eddie asked, courtesy of all for one. He hired them the night after his and All Might's encounter. Mine and the collective suspicions were confirmed. All for one is now Null's herald. Sleeper explained, that Darth Vader clone is working for that asshole. Venom exclaimed angrily, I felt him inside of the hive mind that night. As did we all, he used the blood hunter's brain to breach the symbiote hive mind, his psychic signature radiating across the multiverse, which is how Null located all for one, bringing him into his domain to enthrall him. Sleeper said as he brought up a holographic screen. Great, just what we needed, two of the biggest threats teaming up and destroying everything. Eddie said with a hint of anger. So then we find these mercenaries, put a stop to their plans to bring their dark god to earth, and that's that. It's not that simple, we need to also ensure that no one else can attempt to free Null by finding the aim of the mercenaries' mission. Sleeper replied. And what would that be, Sir Knight? Venom asked. One of the first symbiotes, a devourer of worlds and civilizations, the Grendel. Sleeper replied, confusing Eddie but made Venom nearly gag in surprise. You're shitting me, right? First the Necroswords, now the Clintarian Dragon of Legend is here on this earth. Venom asked in disbelief. Wait, hold up, a dragon. No one said there would be a dragon. Eddie exclaimed. It merely takes the form of a dragon, but it is a symbiote, one of the first created by Null using his blood and shadow. The Grendel decimated worlds, devouring its inhabitants and spreading the King in Black's message of death and entropy across the cosmos. However, somehow when it came to this planet, humanity was able to put it in a slumber, preventing it from destroying their world. Sleeper explained. And these mercs are going to awaken the Grendel. Eddie asked. Correct. Doing so will give Null a vessel, allowing him to manifest into physical reality and continue his quest of omnicide across the multiverse. Not only that, but this will allow him to reconnect to the symbiote hive mind and attempt to dominate and control all symbiotes connected to it. Sleeper said before finding a location on the holographic screen. I sent out drones to scan the planet for their location. And fortunately they've managed to acquire the information we seek. Where are they? Venom asked curiously. Finland, a European country bordering Sweden, Norway and Russia. Sleeper replied. This must mean that the Grendel is somewhere in the Nordic descended lands. How do you know so much about Earth countries? Eddie asked. The internet. Sleeper replied bluntly. All right then, I'm surprised you admitted it. Eddie said. I don't share humanity's fragile ego. Sleeper said bluntly. So then what do we do with the mercs? Venom asked. Capture and interrogate them, and hand them over to Japanese authorities, as per the agreement with the Hero Public Safety Commission. Sleeper replied. Seriously, can't we just eat them? Venom asked. You really they're going to tolerate you consuming the targets. They already dislike you for going against their rules and regulations. I wouldn't risk further antagonizing them if you want to stay free. Sleeper replied. You call this free? Having Night Eye confine us to his agency, doing chores and waiting until you show up to actually do something productive and worth our damn time. Eddie asked in a frustrated tone. Would you rather be put in solitary confinement? Sleeper asked, to which Eddie couldn't argue or object to his question. I understand your plight, and I believe that only your universe's authorities should be allowed to prosecute you for your actions. But of the many factions and organizations across the multiverse, none deal with crimes committed by variants outside of their native universes, not unless they are temporal crimes. So I really have to suck up to some other universe's feds, all because I'm human, Eddie said, lowering his head. It could be worse, Eddie, they could throw us in a hole so deep we wouldn't be able to climb out. Venom said, focus on what you can do, not what you can't, Edward Brock. If complying with the commission can allow us to find a way of returning you to your universe, then we will do what we must. Sleeper said, I know, I know, I just, night eye, god he pisses me off, Eddie said, scratching his head. His attempts at humor are either shit or really creepy, I mean look what he did to Bubble Girl the other day. That was just Venom said, trailing off and gagging in disgust. Yeah Hetty sighed. But anyway, it's good to be out of that building for once. Sleeper nodded in agreement before increasing his ship's speed, heading towards Finland as fast as they could. Eddie and Venom mentally prepared themselves for whatever fight was coming their way. We will be at our destination soon, then our mission can begin. Sleeper said, at the very least, we can kick ass and save the world. Venom roared. Yeah, what he said. Eddie said with a shrug as Sleeper's ship descended to the ground, landing on the finished grass below.
Eddie and Sleeper soon exited the ship, with the Knight of the Cosmos bringing up his HUD to track down his targets, while Eddie and Venom observed a nearby clearing which had a decent view of the mountains and forests. Quite the clearing this forest has, Eddie remarked. Fancy yourself a vacation in the Finnish countryside. Venom asked sarcastically, maybe next time, but work comes first, pal. Eddie replied, where are the mercs at, sleeper? If my sensors are accurate, they should be only 15 miles from our location, in the city of Helsinki. Sleeper replied as he followed the coordinates on his HUD. Venom then formed over Eddie's body and followed his fellow symbiote. The two moved as quickly and discreetly as possible, either on foot or using their tendrils to swing and zip line across trees and boulders. Well, Eddie, looks like we're getting that exercise we wanted. Venom remarked. Yeah, yeah, you are complaining about it too. Eddie retorted. We have no idea when we'll see Carnage again, and that pisses me off. We need to eat her before that Darth Vader clone can make more symbiotes with her. Venom roared. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to locate their base of operation. It appears to be protected from my sensors in some way, possibly with one of all for one's quirks. Sleeper explained. Bastard, hiding away and scheming with Null no doubt. Eddie said as he, Venom and Sleeper reached a clearing and sure enough, they could see Helsinki, the capital of Finland, right in front of them. Here we are, Helsinki, capital city of Finland, founded in 1550 and located on the Gulf of Finland. Sleeper said, that was a long time ago, especially in this universe. Venom remarked, now, where are these bad guys we're after? My sensors indicate that the mercenaries should be east from our position. Sleeper replied, and how exactly are you tracking them? Eddie asked, I've been tracking them since they left Japan. Sleeper replied, you've been following their trail the whole time. Do the suits know about that? Venom asked. They know I've been pursuing them, but not when I started my hunt. Sleeper replied, before opening up his holographic hut again. Interesting, they're getting closer to our position. Wait, they know we're here. Eddie exclaimed. No, it's purely coincidence, their objective must be near the vicinity. Sleeper replied. We should intercept them before they complete their mission. Venom nodded, for both him and Eddie as they followed Sleeper, who was following the trail his sensors were picking up. The three of them tried their best to avoid open streets and crowds in Helsinki, not wanting the locals to discover their presence unless absolutely necessary. Venom and Sleeper soon stopped on the rooftop of one of the buildings within a marketplace, and before they could do anything else, an eruption of what looked like lava could be seen in the distance. What the fuck was that? Venom exclaimed in horror. There's our mercenaries, Sleeper said as he slowly went towards the epicenter of the eruption. Hold on, wait a second, you never told us one of them had a lava quirk. Eddie shouted as Venom followed Sleeper. The Volcano Thieves, considered to be one of Japan's best mercenary teams. Sleeper said, were you just going to let us fight an enemy we have a disadvantage over without telling us? Eddie exclaimed angrily. Eddie's right, how are we going to fight a lava-spewing villain? Heat doesn't exactly agree with our kind. Venom added, just follow my lead, and you'll never even touch lava. Sleeper said as they soon arrived on the scene where the volcano thieves were, with the three of them standing in a freshly made crater from their leader's eruption. A boss, not that I doubt your judgment or actions, but why did you make such a big eruption? Dust Boy yelled angrily. We were surrounded, what else could I have done? Volcano argued before firing another wave of lava at a group of local police officers. Yeah, but that blast was large enough for the whole city to see where we're at. Dusty Ash exclaimed. We already smoked Helsinki's pro hero, no one else is going to be a problem. Volcano assured, until he saw something black zip past his shoulder before being drop kicked into the building behind him by Venom. What the hell just happened? Gust Boy yelled in confusion. Shit, that must have been another pro. Dusty Ash answered. Venom grinned before backflipping over to Sleeper, who simply rolled his eyes at his partner's lack of subtlety. Was the drop kick necessary? Eddie asked with a sigh. We know you thought it was cool. Venom replied. Bastard. Volcano yelled as he burst out of the building he was sent into, his eyes rabid with anger. Sorry, Magma Man. Did I make you angry? Venom asked mockingly, angering Volcano even more. Wait, you gotta be kidding me. The Hasu Vigilante. Gust Boy exclaimed in disbelief. That's lethal protector to you, criminal scum. Venom roared. What the hell is he doing here? Dusty Ash shouted but then regained her composure as she gripped her sword. Oh, F it. Let's deal with him. Volcano thieves, your mission ends here. Give yourself up or we will make you surrender by force. Sleeper said to the mercenaries. Wait, who is he? Dusty Ash blurted. Who cares? Both of them are dead Volcano said, gritting his teeth. You think we're going to surrender to you two freaks? We're the Volcano Thieves, best mercenaries in the business. Damn right, you tell em, boss. Dust Boy exclaimed. 
These are meant to be Japan's best mercs. Eddie asked awkwardly. More like a bunch of dangerous idiots to me. Venom said with a snarl. Hey guys, a little less flexing and more killing. Dusty Ash yelled. Get ready. Sleeper said, taking a stance. Venom licked his lips before charging at Volcano, who tried to blast the lethal protector with a stream of lava. However, Venom fortunately made a tendril that zip-lined him out of the attack's range, then attempted to zip-line back with another tendril that latched onto the ground. Dust Boy, however intercepted Venom's movements and spun his hands around, blowing the lethal protector away with impressive air currents. Sleeper leaped into the fray and launched his acid-tipped tendrils at the Volcano Thieves, which Volcano blocked with his gauntlet, and Gust Boy aimed his spinning hands downward to propel himself upwards out of the tendril's range. Volcano decided to take the offensive and threw a strong right hook at Sleeper, but the Knight of the Cosmos blocked the attack and then struck Volcano a few times around his torso with quick and precise punches. Enraged by the pain from Sleeper's blows, Volcano's shoulder Volcano started to spill out thick layers of smoke before he thrusted his gauntlet forward and fired a barrage of lava blasts at Sleeper. Venom noticed this and tried to intervene but he quickly turned around to block the blade of Dusty Ash's Tanto with his own newly formed blade. Mind if I cut in? Dusty Ash asked playfully as she pushed against Venom's blade before moving herself to the side while spraying some dust at his face, sliding her blade away and cutting across his chest several times. Geez, cliche much. Venom said, gritting his teeth as he healed and wiped the dust off his face before blocking another attack from Dusty Ash and launched a few tendrils at her. After Dusty Ash deflected the tendrils with her tanto, she ran towards the Hasu vigilante and began to emit a large amount of dust off her body. She then brought her arms in front of her and swiped them outward to propel the dust ahead of her, creating a smoke screen to mask her movements. I dunno, just thought a guy like you would appreciate a good cliché. You've introduced yourself as the lethal protector after all. Dusty Ash remarked as she concealed herself within the dust, her voice slightly altered by her respirator. Well, looks like she doesn't like the name either, Eddie remarked, as Venom leaped out of the dust cloud and started swinging his blade at Dusty Ash. Shut up. It's a good name. Venom yelled as he and Dusty Ash countered and parried each other's strikes with their blades respectively. No, it's not. Dusty Ash taunted as she threw more dust in his face after blocking another slash and tried to counter with her own strike. Yes it is. Venom yelled before blocking Dusty Ash's blade, then quickly used his free arm to land a punch on the Ash-themed villain, making her skid on the ground a few feet before managing to make herself stand up back into a fighting stance. How rude. Have you no shame for hitting a girl such as myself, Venom? Dusty Ash asked while readjusting her respirator and bra strap that came loose. My hands are rated E for everyone, lady. Venom roared before he started to spin his blade around like a drill, then lunged at Dusty Ash with it. Damn, Dusty Ash thought as she narrowly avoided his attack, jumping to one side. I thought he could only create shields and tendrils from the footage that we watched, but it seems that he has more tricks up his sleeve. She's using her quirk to create a smokescreen so that we can't see her when she attacks, except we literally have special vision powers now. Eddie commented with a sigh as Venom dodged and blocked each attack Dusty Ash hit them with. What do you think I've been doing the whole time, Eddie? She can't hide from my eyes. Venom remarked before addressing Dusty Ash again. And what do you call this stupid attack? Battle Royal. No, that's the stupidest name for an attack I've ever heard of. Dusty Ash replied as she then released a large amount of dust from her body, covering the area in a big cloud of dust. More than what she did before. She stealthily moved around in her dust cloud for a bit before finally pouncing on Venom, slashing him across the torso before retreating back into the cloud. But not too long after, Dusty Ash followed up with another slash from another direction, continuing to do it several times while getting faster and faster after each consecutive attack. She dashed at him one more time but landed multiple slashes up and down Venom's entire body, before ending it with a slice across his neck. Dust Storm Slicer. Dusty Ash shouted. Venom fell to the ground, both him and Eddie coughing their lungs out. I'll admit it, that actually hurt Eddie said weakly as Venom got back up and healed from his injuries. Well, it would have killed someone without a symbiote, I'll give it that. Venom commented, cracking his neck and wrists as he fully recovered. Shit, I should have figured that he could regenerate. Dusty Ash said, as she dodged an incoming attack from one of Venom's tendrils. As those two continued to fight, Sleeper was weaving and dodging Volcano's lava blasts, before he unleashed a stream of green acid at the mercenary, only for Gust Boy to redirect the acid with a strong air current. Sleeper formed his necrosword and rushed at Volcano and Gust Boy, with the former blocking his sword with his gauntlet, 
then parried a few more of Sleeper's sword strikes. I can see why they are considered to be Japan's best mercenaries. It's not necessarily in how they act, but in their strength and experience. We've underestimated them. Sleeper thought before leaping out of the way of a combined blast of lava and air from Volcano and Gust Boy. Slippery bastard. Stay still and taste my magma. Volcano yelled as he lifted his gauntlet-clad arm up while smoke poured and erupted from his shoulders, preparing to use his own special attack. Dusty Ash, watch out, the boss is going to erupt. Gust Boy yelled, seeing his boss raise his arm up. The villainess then smirked before dodging backwards in order to avoid the area of effect that she knew Volcano would cover with his attack. Volcanon. Volcano screamed as he unleashed a barrage of lava blasts into the air, which rained down and struck fast and swiftly like flaming meteors. Shit. Venom exclaimed as he tried his best to dodge some of the falling lava. Sleeper was having better luck at dodging. Being a symbiote without a host let him carefully weave and move around each bit of falling lava. He got close to Volcano and struck him with a strong punch coated in acidic vapor to the torso, causing Volcano to stagger back and fall off balance which cancelled his attack. Volcano roared in anger and pain as he felt his skin beneath his costume burn from the acidic punch. Boss, are you okay? Gust Boy asked with a concerned look. I'm fine. Volcano yelled, straightening himself up. That stings. Really bad. That was a close one. Eddie said out of breath. Yeah wasn't sure we'd survive that one Venom said before dodging gunfire from Dusty Ash. This girl just busted out the gat. I'm not through with you yet. Dusty Ash remarked before tossing the empty magazine aside and inserting a new one, pulling back the bolt and began firing her mini Uzi at Venom again. Venom dodged a few of the bullets before simply opening his mouth and letting the bullets go inside, eating each pellet of lead fired at him. Venom then grinned before he spat all of the bullets back at Dusty Ash. She was momentarily stunned at what just happened, but then drew her tanto as fast as she could to block and dodge the redirected bullets. A few of them had managed to graze her, however. Damn, that's quite the trick you've got there, big guy. Dusty Ash remarked after a whistle, catching a glance at a small scrape on her arm. Be glad that me swallowing those bullets made them non-lethal. Venom roared before leaping into the air, coiling a makeshift drill around his legs and launched a dive kick at Dusty Ash. She barely managed to avoid his attack and fired off another burst of bullets, though Venom dodged them this time and used a tendril to zip line back to Sleeper's position. Sleeper, though not possessing a straightforwardly destructive power as Volcano and Gust Boy, was able to outpace them, first landing a strong uppercut on Gust Boy, sending him flying into a nearby two-story building and then dodged Volcano's lava blast before firing a stream of acid at him, which melted a portion of his suit's torso area, burning his skin. Motherfucker, Volcano yelled. Dusty Ash, Gust Boy. To my position now, right away, boss. Dusty Ash responded before shooting a stream of dust at Venom and then retreated back to Volcano. Gotcha, Gust Boy replied, propelling himself towards Volcano and Dusty Ash with blasts of air from his spinning hands. What's the plan now, Volcano? Time to show these freaks our real strength. Prepare the team attack. Volcano yelled. You got it, boss, Gust Boy said, then spread his arms out and spun his hands, channeling air around him and his team to create a spiral of air. Let's fucking do this, Dusty Ash said with a nod and then emitted a large amount of dust from her body once again, which was carried by Gust Boy's air spiral, creating a layer of dust around it. Uh, what are they doing? And shouldn't we be stopping this? Eddie asked. I wanna see what happens. Venom argued. What do you mean? This isn't some anime or turn-based RPG. Stop them, Eddie yelled. Sleeper rushed towards the volcano thieves and tried to use his necrosword to cut through the spiral of air and dust. But it was too thick, and its rotation moved too fast, repelling Sleeper and shielding the mercenaries. Nice try, dumbass. When my air and Dawes dust mix together, it creates the ultimate defense. Gust Boy taunted. I could try and slice through it with my necrosword at full power, but then I would be drained and vulnerable to their next attack. Sleeper explained. Brace yourselves, Venom. Volcano chuckled sinisterly before thrusting his gauntlet forward as smoke and embers erupted out of his shoulder volcanoes. Let's see you dodge this, you amorphous bastard. Volcano yelled. Krakatoa blast. Volcano then unleashed a devastating wave of lava, to which the air and dust surrounded them wrapped around the lava to create their combined move. A beam of lava, dust and air. Oh shit. Venom yelled as he and Sleeper ducked out of the way of the attack, in which the beam consumed the buildings, vehicles and architecture, creating an explosion that engulfed the street. Venom and Sleeper did their best to avoid the explosion, given the intense heat and flames created from it. 
However, a few flames from the explosion were able to hit Venom and Sleeper, burning the biomass on their legs and knocking them to the ground. Shit, they got Venom and Sleeper's legs, Eddie exclaimed, while also feeling the burning sensation from the flames. After the explosion had faded away, a cloud of smoke took its place and spread across Helsinki, revealing the large crater and burnt debris from the volcano thieves' attack. Venom and Sleeper painfully got back on their feet, using a significant portion of their strength to heal from the flames. Yeah, that's right. Don't mess with the volcano thieves. Gus Boy shouted as he deactivated his quirk. Well that was fun while it lasted, but let's bounce and get back on track, boys. Dusty Ash said, looking back at Volcano and Gus Boy. Agreed, let's find that next clue before these two freaks catch up. Volcano said, turning to flee the scene with his comrades. However, before Venom and Sleeper could pursue them, Gus Boy was shot in the leg causing him to stumble and fall, with the sound of a rifle being fired being heard afterward. Kazatani, Dusty Ash yelled before putting her arm around Gus Boy and lifted him up. What the hell just happened? Eddie asked. There's a sniper nearby, and they're after our targets. Sleeper replied as he used his sensors to try and locate them. Dusty Ash released more dust from her body to try and cover their escape. But then she noticed the skin on her arms and legs were starting to get dry. Shit, already. Boss, I don't think I can cover us from that sniper. We really gotta get out of here. Volcano got in front of both Gus Boy and Dusty Ash and erupted smoke from his shoulders to try and make a smoke screen to hide from the sniper. Once the smoke cloud he made was big enough, he grabbed both Gus Boy and Dusty Ash and sprinted off with them. Hey, they're getting away. Venom roared. We can always track them down again with my sensors. Right now we need to deal with our competition. Sleeper said as he then weaved his body around another sniper shot. Shit, they know we're on to them. Eddie yelled before Venom dodged a sniper shot from their competitor. I have their location, let's move. Sleeper yelled as he dashed across the street. Venom gritted his teeth before following Sleeper, ducking and moving behind cover along the way to avoid the sniper. Two more sniper shots were, but fortunately Venom and Sleeper were not hit and they kept moving closer and closer to the shooter's location. Stupid sniper. Their aiming's pretty inaccurate. Venom taunted. No, they're not shooting to kill right now, only to discourage us. If the trajectory of each shot I've measured is correct, they're missing on purpose. Sleeper said, dodging another sniper shot. They're firing on us, knowing we'd be able to dodge them. Eddie asked in disbelief. I believe so, we're getting closer to their location. Sleeper replied as he continued to get closer. Venom followed soon after, and this time when a sniper shot was fired, he stuck out a tendril and to the surprise of Eddie and Sleeper, caught the bullet in mid-flight. You caught it, Eddie exclaimed. I didn't think I'd be fast enough to, but I guess we are getting stronger Venom said before putting the bullet in his hand, looking at it curiously. Hold on, something's weird about this bullet. Sleeper moved closer to Venom and looked at the bullet. It was shaped like a sniper bullet, however it wasn't lead or the color gray or silver. Instead it was dark blue with pink streaks and felt soft but coarse. Wait is that hair? Eddie exclaimed, both in shock and disgust. Yuwa, the sniper was shooting us with their own hair. It must be the sniper's quirk. They can turn their hair into sniper bullets. Sleeper concluded. Yeah, that's handy but still gross Eddie said, before Venom and Sleeper then kept moving and dodged another sniper shot. Damn coward. Fight fair. Venom roared. Sleeper spotted something on one of the rooftops, the lens flare of possibly a scope, identifying the sniper and their location. He gestured to Venom silently, pointing out their location, to which Venom also looked and saw the lens flare. Venom and Sleeper then with all their strength moved swiftly across the street and then used their tendrils to zip line towards the building where the sniper had set up their vantage point. After latching on the walls of the building on opposite ends, Venom and Sleeper leaped up to the rooftop and pointed their respective weapons at the sniper. That's enough, we've found you, marksman, Sleeper said in a commanding tone. All right you hair-slinging bastard, tell us who Venom yelled before losing his words upon seeing the sniper's appearance. The sniper appeared to be a woman with short, dark blue hair with numerous pink streaks scattered around, with two strands reaching down to her shoulders. She also had purple eyes, with a scouter over her right eye. She wore a dark, sleeveless bodysuit with two armor plates underneath her chest along with knee guards, like colored boots and had a metallic utility belt that stored more of her bullets. But what was most eye-catching about her was that a barrel was coming out of her right elbow, with a tendril forming a scope. Wait, the sniper's a girl. Venom exclaimed. You got a problem with girl snipers, big mouth. The female sniper said with a snarky tone. I know just Venom said, tumbling with his words. Just what? The female sniper asked. 
wait, is that sniper rifle coming out of Ogata Getty said, as Venom was forced back into his body and quickly leaned over the side of the rooftop to vomit out his lunch. What's his problem? The female sniper asked Sleeper. He is not used to seeing such a harsh mutation of flesh and bone before. Sleeper replied before keeping his gaze fixed on the sniper. We are off topic. Who sent you, Marksman? Were you following us? I didn't need to follow you. I already had a good shot at my targets until you showed up. The sniper replied before looking over at Eddie who just finished vomiting. Okay I think I'm good now it's all gone Eddie said out of breath. His throat sore and strained from regurgitation. Are you sure you're professionals? The female sniper asked with a brow raised. He is, but we're more freelancers vigilantes, Eddie replied, before Venom reformed around his body again. So you must be the aliens the female sniper remarked, looking at Venom and Sleeper. They told me about you, I didn't believe them at first, but here you are. Someone told you about us, Venom asked. They didn't sound happy about you either, the female sniper replied. The commissioned sleeper said, trying his best to hold back his anger. Why am I not surprised? Eddie said with a groan. Those damn control freaks. They just can't help but screw around with us again. Venom shouted. Sleeper then angrily smashed a nearby pipe with his tendril, trying his best not to let his emotions overcome him. Venom sighed before looking at the female sniper. Oh yeah, they tell us to bring them in, and yet hire you to take them down. That's the Hero Public Safety Commission for ya. The female sniper said with a shrug before retracting her sniper rifle back into her elbow. So now what? We're all after the same people, but one of us has orders to kill. Eddie said as Venom retracted back into his body, then protruded out of it again in serpentine form. Look, I just took the job to get out of that damn prison. I don't like being under the commission's thumb as much as you do. The female sniper said. Then perhaps we should work together for now, then we'll decide our course of action when we track down the targets again. Sleeper suggested, regaining his composure. You sure that's a good idea? How do we know she won't stab us or shoot us in the back? Venom asked Sleeper. I can still hear you. The sniper said with an annoyed tone. My ammunition comes from my hair, the more hair I have the more bullets I can make. But as you can clearly see, they cut my hair to limit my rounds, and so I can't afford to waste them on you lot, especially with how you can regenerate. Well, sounds like a fair argument to me, Eddie said, looking at Venom and Sleeper. It is a fair argument, the female sniper insisted. All right, fine, but if you try to shoot us again, I'll bite your head off. Venom threatened. Oh how lovely, the sniper said sarcastically. I am Sleeper, Knight of the Cosmos, here to ensure Null remains imprisoned. Sleeper explained. We have the same mission, even if our methods and orders were not the same. I'm Eddie, this is Venom, Eddie said, pointing at his symbiotic companion. Hi, Venom said simply. What is this? A group therapy session where we sit around in a circle and talk about our shitty childhoods. The sniper asked with a groan. So you're too cool to give out your name then? Eddie asked. I'm merely asking what's the point of giving out our names? The sniper replied. So then what do we call you then? Venom asked curiously, causing the female sniper to sigh. It's Nagant, Lady Nagant. All right, Lady Nagant it is. Eddie said with a nod. What the hell's a Nagant? Venom asked in confusion. I think it's a gun. Eddie replied. Moss and Nagant, five shot, bolt action, internal magazine, fed military rifle. Made in 1891 and approved by Captain Sergei Ivanovich Mossin for the Russo-Ottoman War. The sniper, now known as Lady Nagant, explained. It was one of the most frequently used bolt action rifles up until the beginning of the 22nd century. You know your stuff, Eddie remarked. I'm a sniper, I need to know these kinds of things. Nagant said, rolling her eyes. I think that's enough talking for now. We should track down the volcano thieves before they get too far. Agreed, let us be off, Sleeper said, bringing up his sensors and attempting to track them down again. Eddie and Venom looked at each other, then sighed before looking out into the city of Helsinki once more. Hours had passed since the incident in Helsinki, and the volcano thieves were fortunate to not be captured or killed by their pursuers. For now, the trio was safe, hiding out in an old farmhouse in a rural part of Finland. Dusty Ash made sure to keep watch in case anyone or anything approached their new safe house while Volcano and Gust Boy tried tending to their injuries. God damn it, it's lodged in deep, Gust Boy said as he tried to pry out the bullet in his leg with a pair of forceps. Boss, can you give me a hand here? My hand and gauntlet are too big for precise tools, moron. Dusty Ash, get in here and help this jackass. Volcano called out. I'll get right on it, Dusty Ash said before speed walking where Gust Boy was sitting and got down on one knee to pry out the bullet as she put her hands around the forceps. This may sting a little. Dusty Ash then felt that the forceps were clamping down on the bullet before pulling it out as thoroughly as possible. 
putting the bullet and forceps aside and then quickly grabbed bandage wraps to close up Gust Boy's wounds. Thanks, Heizono. Gust Boy panting a little from the pain of having the bullet removed. No problem, Kazutani. Dusty Ash said with a smirk, then turned to inspect the bullet that she pulled out, and her eyes widened. Oh shit they sent her after us. Her? Gust Boy asked confused before seeing the bullet and noticed its blue and pink color. Lady Nagant. Volcano said with a growl. Wait, the Lady Nagant, Japan's best sniper, Gust Boy exclaimed. Seems like it. Thus the Ash replied with a sigh while seeing that her skin was beginning to become smooth again. I'm almost fully recovered from using my quirk. Anyway, did you guys find the location of the next clue yet? We don't even know if there's a clue inside this thing or not. Gust Boy said, holding what looked like a small rusty box. We didn't break into that vintage factory for some random box, Kazutani. Volcano said with a groan. So what are we waiting for? Let's just open it. Dusty Ash stated before taking the lid off the box. Inside of the box was an old compass with Nordic runes engraved on the sides. Though the most peculiar thing is that the needle, which is meant to point north, was pointing in a different direction instead. Whoa, is that a compass? Gus Boy said though notice the needle's direction. Shouldn't that be pointing north? Dusty Ash looked at the compass more closely, picking up the box with both hands and turned herself to face in different directions but also saw the direction the needle was facing towards the same location no matter what. How well would you look at that? She said before turning back towards Gust Boy and Volcano and looked up at them. I guess it was changed to be set to point on a fixed location, so we should move out once we've recovered. Fortunately, Nagant wasn't shooting to kill. Whoever sent her wanted to interrogate us before she puts a bullet in our skulls. Volcano said, well, we're not gonna let that happen, right boys? Dusty Ash asked as she put the box back down on the table. You bet, hot stuff. Dust Boy replied with a grin. We also need to avoid those two alien freaks. Heat and sound may be fatal to them, but that won't stop them from trying to fight us again. Volcano said before standing up. Why don't we just use our team attack again? Dust Boy asked. Because it overtaxes our quirks if we use it repeatedly. Volcano replied as he cracked his knuckles. Yeah, and I'm sure you wouldn't want to see my entire body covered in dry skin, now would you? Dusty Ash remarked to Gus Boy before walking back to the window and peeked her head out a little while gripping her tanto with one hand. It seems like Venom has different attacks than what was seen on social media and the news, so we are still not sure what they are fully capable of. I hope we still have the chance to get out of here before they show up. Agreed, but at least we have the compass and can follow the needle to wherever it leads. Volcano said, Question is, where does it lead based on the direction it's facing? It's gotta be one of the Nordic countries. Gust Boy replied. But how do we make sure of it? Simple. We just look at our own location, then back at the compass to see which country it's pointing to. Dusty Ash replied as she took out her phone and turned it on to see where they were located, then tossed it to them. Catch. Volcano caught her phone and then looked at the compass on the table, before turning to face the direction its needle was pointing in. Are the two of you alright to move on? I'm definitely ready to keep moving. Dusty Ash replied. But which country are we heading to next, boss? Whichever one this compass is pointing towards. Volcano replied. Which country would that be? Can't we check on our map app? Gust Boy suggested. Dusty Ash then walked back over to Volcano and looked over his arm to see where the compass was pointing in relation to their location on her phone. The phone's map app indicated that the compass was most likely pointing in the direction of Sweden. Looks like it's pointing towards Sweden. Dusty Ash said looking up to Gust Boy. So it's not too far. Still, we're gonna have to take a bit of time in searching that area. Agreed, all while dodging Nagant and those aliens. Volcano said. Once we're sure that we can move again, we bounce. You got it boss. Dusty Ash said with a nod. Gotcha, my wrists should be good to go soon. Gust Boy said as he cracked his wrists and waited alongside his comrades. Somewhere within Osaka, there existed a compound. One belonging to the infamous Yakuza Syndicate. The Shai Hasekai, which in Japanese means the eight precepts of death which in Buddhism are a set of strict moral guidelines to be followed by the most serious of adherents, lest they lose their chance at enlightenment. The compound is a large residence disguised as business office buildings with the upper floors and the outside of the hideout decorated like a traditional Japanese residence controlled by the Yakuza. Inside of the compound within a large office was Kai Chisaki, better known as Overhaul who was in deep thought about the alliance with All for One, the revelation of the existence of extraterrestrial life, 
and what it meant for his syndicate. Life, life on other planets it's not just science fiction and urban legends. It's real all for one and his benefactor they know something we don't whatever it is. I don't think things will go back to the way they were before. And my dream of ridding humanity of quirks feels less and less possible. Overhaul looked to his left, seeing the doorway which led to a room where their boss was in a coma, hooked up to life support systems. He then got out of his seat and approached the room, looking at the once great Yakuza boss in their weak and near catatonic state. Before, I believed that I owed you everything for taking me in and treating me like family when no one else would. I wanted to rid the world of quirks in order to give the Yakuza a fighting chance of reclaiming their honor and their territories across Japan and beyond. Overhaul said, looking at the unconscious boss while doing so, then clenched his fist and hardened his gaze. Truth is I was always seeing the incomplete picture, a piece of the puzzle but not in its entirety. I put you in this bed thinking that the only obstacle I would face was pro-heroes and rival gangs and villains. But I glimpsed another piece of the puzzle. I opened a doorway out of the ignorant pond I was swimming in and looked upon the vast ocean, even if it was only for a brief moment. Aliens exist and whatever plan all for one and his benefactor has for them, it makes my goals pointless. What would taking away quirks accomplish when there are countless life forms out there with their own abilities and skills that would make our achievements as humans obsolete? Overhaul then took off one of his surgical gloves and slowly reached his bare hand out towards the boss, before planting it on their face and slowly activated his quirk, which caused the unconscious boss to suddenly open his eyes, eyes that stared back at Overhaul in fear. You stupid bastard had you not objected to my plans then you could have still let us, you could have still survived what comes next. All this time I thought I owed you something for taking me in, for teaching me how to be a Yakuza but the truth is, both of us were stuck in the past, you especially, talking about honor and codes like we're in the Edo period what a joke. The now conscious boss began to panic, and his muffled screams could be heard as Overhaul slowly used his quirk to rip apart the boss face layer by layer. The one who survives is the one who is victorious, regardless of what means you must resort to in order to stay alive. I'll usury how I see fit. If they want a way to negate and remove quirks, then all for one can have it. But so long as she is in my possession, then I will use her to outlast any hero or villain, whatever the cost goodbye. Boss, hope the devil has a special place for you in hell now hurry up and die. Overhaul then slammed his hand down on the boss face, shattering his skull, muscles, blood and brain matter all across the bed to which the heart monitor he was hooked up to flatlined upon their head being smashed into paste. Overhaul then turned away and went over to a nearby sink, then wasted the blood and brain matter off his hand before his germophobia overwhelmed him. He then turned his head around and saw that Chronostasis had walked in and discovered their boss remains before looking at his leader with a mix of fear and concern. We don't have any need for that fossil anymore, Chronostasis, not when there are greater threats than quirks out there in the cosmos. Overhaul said with an indifferent tone, but you could have healed him, Chronostasis argued. And then what? Let him take Eri away, break our alliance with all for one and then end up as one of the casualties of that madman's war. I was already running our operations fine without him, the old ways are gone, time to embrace the future. Overhaul explained before putting his surgical glove back on. Now, are you going to stand in my way or are you going to survive alongside me? Mimic and the eight bullets are on board with this course of action, so I suggest you get on board as well. Do I make myself clear, Chronostasis? Yes, sir, Chronostasis said with a nod before he left the room to give Overhaul some time alone. Overhaul let out a sigh before he then walked out of the room and headed downstairs into what looked like a secret underground bunker and facility. After a few minutes of walking, he approached a door and then opened it before entering inside of the room, which was dimly lit, had a medium-sized bed in the middle and a few toys scattered on the floor. On the bed in the fetal position was a young girl with long gray hair, red eyes and a light yellow horn protruding out of the right side of her forehead and was wearing only a hospital gown and had bandages wrapped around her arms and legs. Eri, Overhaul said to the girl. The girl, identified as Eri, stood up and looked at Overhaul with fear in her eyes and a sense of dread and hopelessness. It appears we have more work to do. Eri, I've made some new friends who want a piece of you so to speak. I know I said before that you could rest up, but the clock is ticking and I need to ensure our survival, Overhaul said, approaching Eri before touching her face, causing the girl to flinch in terror before tears started to run down her face. I am an angel of death, and you are my scythe, Eri, my weapon, my tool in which I will cleanse and execute those who stand in my way. Please, please no more today. You promised Eri sobbed, failing to remain composed and calm in Overhaul's presence. Promises change, just like people do Overhaul said before he grabbed Eri by the arm and pulled her out of the room, 
despite her best efforts to break free from his hold. Don't bother struggling. You know that I can put you back together no matter how many times I break you. Very soon became submissive, but her fear and dread remained as she walked with overhaul out of the room and across the hallway into a room with a spotlight, operating table and various medical and surgical tools placed on a nearby desk. After he re-entered the room, Overhaul soon followed through and closed the door behind them, as the sign on the door lit up, saying theater in use. Just this morning authorities have stumbled upon a gruesome discovery in the streets of Tokyo, where the bodies of Shikesu High School students Kami Utsushimi and Inasaya Orashi were found in alleyways near Shibuya Station. Utsushimi was a second year while Yeorashi was a first year. Both had recently taken part in the provisional license exam, though upon investigation. It was revealed that Utsushimi had never taken part of the exam with belongings such as her uniform, an ID being found in a dumpster outside of the train station and CCTV footage showing an unknown assailant dumping Utsushimi's remains in the spot where police found her. The assailant is currently unidentified, but the authorities are working hard to try and catch the killer before they take any more lives. In response to these two murders, both the principals of Shikesu and Yue High School released these statements to the media. We at UA offer our deepest condolences to the victims and their families, as we are unfortunately quite familiar with our own students being targeted by villains and criminals. Starting this week, UA will increase our security detail in the form of posting more staff and pro heroes around school grounds and installing facial recognition and DNA identification software and hardware on each of the school's entrances and staff areas as per request from the Hero Public Safety Commission. Nezu explained, but you have stated something along those lines a few months ago. What makes you think that this will be enough to ensure the students' safety this time? The reporter challenged while raising his hand. Because UA will no longer be in this situation alone. The Shikesu principal answered. Since the attack on the USJ, UA has had to alter its curriculum and security protocols to ensure their students' safety and has been doing so alone this entire while facing criticism and ridicule from the media and press. Starting today, Shikesu High School alongside Ketsubutsu High School and several other hero schools will be collaborating with UA High School in a joint operation to ensure the safety and security of their students and staff members. We are calling this operation the Hero School Alliance or HSA for short. Nezu added, We are not going to tolerate half-hearted efforts anymore. The time for school rivalries and bad blood is over. We have to stand together if we want to survive what comes next. This news report and press conference was all being shown on a large TV within the cafeteria of UA, where many of its students could hear and watch it for themselves. Suffice to say, their reactions and opinions were varied, especially for students of Class 1A. I still find it hard to believe that Principal Nezu was able to convince the other schools to collaborate with each other, given our past rivalries and how jealous they are of UA. S. Reputation. Kaminari commented before eating some of his lunch. With All Might retiring and all of the League of Villains members free, it makes sense to try and keep the future generation of heroes safe, even if it means putting aside petty grudges. Midoriya said, then took a bite out of a rice ball. I can't believe that those two were murdered not just cause we only just met them, but also the fact that apparently the Utsushimi at the exam wasn't even the real deal, she was already dead Yuraka said with a solemn tone. Then who was the chick that Midoriya faced? Were they the killer? Linda asked nervously as sweat poured down his face. Whoever that fake Utsushimi was, they transformed into Yuraka and then their disguise peeled off like wet clay or mud. Midoriya described, remembering his fight with Utsushimi. Then we'll keep in mind those details, Midoriya, in case this assailant attempts to break into UA. Ida said with a vigilant stare. Damn it, they're cancelling the special courses. Bakugo yelled. That was my only chance to get my provisional license. Hey relax, Bekugo, I'm sure they'll reschedule it to a later date once they sorted stuff out. Tirishima said, trying to keep his classmate calm before looking over to the table where Shoto Todoroki was sitting. Besides, Todoroki won't be able to get his license right now either so you're both in the same boat. That doesn't make it any less easy to grasp, especially after those Shikesu students were murdered Todoroki said in a solemn tone remembering his interactions with Yeorashi which caused him to feel even more upset. Yeorashi he despised my dad for his callous and ruthless behavior, and when I showed him the same attitude when we first met, he dropped out of UA. So you remember him, Todoroki? Midoriya asked. It wasn't instant when I asked him why he had a problem with me, but now that he's now that he's gone, I remember it more clearly now. I was so focused on not becoming my dad that I pushed aside everything else, including people who just wanted to be my friend. 
and then in that moment when he approached me after the entrance exams, I coldly dismissed him. In the same way my dad dismissed other people now I understand why he was so angry and bitter and now I can't make amends or get to know him I lost my chance to make things right. But Todoroki, you didn't know how Yeorashi felt, and it's not like he was going to tell you what the problem was. He chose to go to Shikesu rather than tolerate being at UA. With you, Midoriya explained. Even so, we both jeopardized one another's chance at getting our licenses, and now now Yeorashi will never become the hero he wanted to be Todoroki said before looking at one of his hands and clenching it. It's true that Yeorashi is gone and that there's nothing we can do to change that, but what you can do is live for them, remember who they were in life and keep your dream alive, for both of your sakes, Midoriya said, getting Todoroki's attention. At least, that's what I think, what about you? No you're right, Midoriya. I will become a hero, not just for myself but also for Yeorashi too. Todoroki declared. That's the spirit, Todoroki. Yuraraka said cheerfully. Midoriya smiled at his friend's newfound confidence and purpose, though his thoughts then turned towards a certain San Franciscan and his alien companion. Wonder if we'll ever see him again he said aloud. See who again? Yuraraka asked curiously. Eddie and Venom Midoriya replied hesitantly getting the other students' attention. Right, you said the two of them were at Hasu. They ate one of the league's gnomus and that villain muscular back at camp. Hiroshima said, scratching his head. So they were criminals the whole time. Asui said, touching her cheek with her index fingers. And why were they at UA? They were just trying to save their own skin. Back Hugo said in a cold and dry tone. Who cares about some foreigner and their alien parasite? Now there's someone else's problem. So we're just going to move on and pretend like none of that stuff happened. That Eddie and Venom helped save us back at the camp, Midoriya argued. But even so, Midoriya, he still broke the law and was fighting crime illegally, Ida added. And with lethal results, Yeyorazu said with a stern look. We broke the law too. We went out and saved Bakugo despite our teachers telling us not to, Hiroshima exclaimed, defending Midoriya's side of the argument. We didn't use your quirk offensively and we didn't kill anyone, Ida argued back. And that makes us better, just because we broke the law in a different way. Hiroshima countered. Well we sure as hell didn't commit cannibalism. Todoroki said. But Venom isn't human, so is it really cannibalism? Takoyami asked. What do you mean? It's Brock's body. Jiro replied. But it's Venom who swallows and eats them, not Brock himself. Takoyami argued. Though Venom's got no stomach, he's just black goo. Kaminari added. We don't know that for sure, Venom's species clearly has a different anatomy to humans. Yeyarazu challenged. Point is, we trusted them, we let them get close and then they lied about their criminal past. They saved us, but at what cost? Killing villains isn't going to make the world safer. If you're going to save the world, then you should do so by the book. Asui explained, being legal doesn't make it right. Midoriya said with a firm tone, making some of his classmates either surprised, angered or intrigued. If there is a situation that requires a hero's attention, but the law forbids them to go and help, is that really the good thing to do? To just do everything by the book while people suffer and die. Midoriya, calm down Ida tried to defuse his friend, only for Midoriya to cut him off. All might lost. He couldn't defeat all for one, and now half the world is up in arms about it. We could have done something to at least ensure that bastard didn't get away, but the law said no. All this power and training and yet what have we really accomplished? Nothing. Because we follow the law to the T instead of trusting our own intuition and instincts. Instead of realizing the bigger picture. Deku please calm down. Hiroraka said quietly, concerned for her friend and Crush's well-being. Midoriya however realized what he just said. His eyes dilated and his head then sunk to the floor, feeling a sense of shame wash over him. I'm sorry Hiroraka Ida forgive me the ninth holder of one for all said in a solemn tone. It's been a hard time for all of us. You're not alone in believing that you messed up or that you could have done more Yuraraka said softly before putting a hand on one of Midoriya's shoulders. I just wish I could somehow talk to Eddie and Venom again. I know that they broke the law and that their methods aren't the most ideal. But they're not bad people. They want to protect others the same way I do Midoriya said with a sigh. I do understand that their intentions are good, Midoriya, but much like the hero killer, Mr. Brock and his companion's methods are still brutal and lethal in nature, and we can't condone murder, not even if they're our friends. Ida said firmly but softly, to which Midoriya nodded silently. Two wrongs don't make a right, Yuraraka said gently. It's something my dad used to say to me. I didn't exactly understand what he meant by it until now. Even so, I still want to speak to them again. I want to know just how good their intentions truly are Midoriya said before he looked up at the ceiling before darting his eyes towards a nearby window and stared at the sky, wondering where Eddie and Venom were now.
a few thousand miles away from Japan and back in Helsinki, Finland. Eddie, Venom and Sleeper had encountered and grouped up with Lady Nagant, who was sent by the commission to interrogate and then assassinate the volcano thieves, despite telling Sleeper that they wanted them brought in alive. Suffice to say, the alliance between the Knights of the Cosmos and the Hero Public Safety Commission was still a complicated situation. Given the Commission's prejudice and distrust towards the Clinter, the four newly formed allies were moving between the streets of the city, trying to not draw too much attention to themselves, especially after the fight between the volcano thieves that destroyed part of a city street. Sleeper was using his scanner to keep track of the mercenary's location while Eddie and Nagant followed behind. Hey Eddie, Venom said, his head sprouting out of Eddie's shoulder. What do you want? We're supposed to be keeping a low profile, which means keeping your face hidden. Eddie said with an annoyed tone. Why is Iceland called Iceland if it's green and Greenland is called Greenland if it's icy? Venom asked, causing Eddie to groan and Nagant to just look at the two with a bemused expression. What does this have to do with anything? Eddie asked. I'm not from Earth, Eddie, so therefore I don't know its history. Venom replied. Why would I know the answer though? I wasn't exactly at the top of my history class back in school. Eddie said, before Nagant moved closer to the two. The Norse back in their Viking days came to Greenland, pillaging and conquering it like everywhere they landed, and then gave it the name Greenland so that more of their Norse comrades would be inclined to settle there, even if it's an icy and cold tundra region. How? False advertisement, Eddie said with an amused tone. Guess they wanted the others to think it was a green and flourishing landmass. And what about Iceland? Venom asked Nagant. The full story is too much of a mouthful. But basically when the Norse first came to Iceland, it was snowing, so they assumed it was a tundra region, hence the name Iceland. But as you can probably guess, it didn't stay that way and sure enough, once spring came around it was green and grassy. Nagant explained, maybe they should have stayed longer before calling it that. Eddie said, dumbasses, and I thought Vikings were meant to be clever. Venom remarked, when has anyone said that Vikings were clever? Eddie retorted, God, you two are a headache. Nagant said with a groan. He's a headache, I'm the voice of reason. Eddie proclaimed. What is a voice of reason that got you fired from your job and ruined Anne's career? Venom asked with a smirk. No, but I doubt you were being reasonable when you attacked Cassidy in his cell, letting him bite me and creating yet another killer symbiote. Eddie shot back at the symbiote, causing Venom to glare at his host. Compose yourselves, unless you want us to be discovered by the local authorities. Sleeper said with a stern tone as he kept monitoring his scanner as they crossed an alleyway filled with wet and dirty trash and garbage. Yes sir, Venom said sarcastically before retracting back into Eddie, who then looked at Nagant again before speaking up. So, Nagant, I'm not telling you my name if that's what you're going to ask. Nagant said firmly, No, not that, I just wondered how you got caught up in the commission's business. Eddie said, to which Nagant sighed. Well before that smart-ass Hawks became the commission's lapdog, I was their weapon, their assassin, tasked with killing the targets they chose for me, given my reputation as Japan's best sniper. Nagant explained, But when I wouldn't take out certain targets for them, they locked me up and branded me a villain. Damn, that's rough Eddie said with a sympathetic tone. Yeah well imagine being inside of Tartarus, unable to move or tend to yourself, having the guards wheel you around and feed you and bathe you, it's fucking humiliating Nagant said with a hint of anger. You're being surprisingly open for someone who doesn't want to share personal information. Eddie remarked. So now you want me to be dishonest? Nagant asked with a brow raised. No, I just didn't think you'd spill the beans like this. Eddie said awkwardly. That's only one part of the story, the rest of it is confidential. Nagant said. All right, I won't pry any further. Eddie said. We are getting closer to the volcano thieves' location. It would be best to return to the ship and re-establish a plan for dealing with them now that Lady Nagant is here. Sleeper said before typing in something on his holographic screen. Then we better get back before we're spotted. Eddie said before Venom formed over his body and started to sprint past Sleeper. Sleeper then caught up soon enough, with Nagant tailing them from behind, trying her best to keep pace with the symbiotes. Venom leaped and jumped between the walls of each alleyway they went through while Sleeper did the same, albeit using his hostless nature to weave and move through the air with more finesse and agility. Nagant, though much slower than the two aliens, was able to move quick enough to keep pace and soon enough, the four newly formed allies arrived back in the forest and headed in the direction of Sleeper's ship. After a few minutes of walking through the forest, they arrived in an open field where the ship was waiting for them. 
so that's an alien spaceship Nagin said, surprised by its design and high-tech appearance. Yeah, pretty cool, huh? Venom said with a grin before retracting back into Eddie. It's not like the spaceships you see in movies. Nagant remarked, were you expecting a disc-shaped saucer and little gray men? Eddie asked with a snarky tone. Now that's just racist, Eddie. Venom said as he sprouted from Eddie's shoulder, annoying the San Franciscan. Let us enter and return to the onboard computer where we can formulate a new strategy. Sleeper said as he opened up the ship and entered inside, followed by Venom and Nagant entering after him. Well, the inside of the ship is just as futuristic and high-tech. Nagant said, looking at the walls, lights and holograms within the ship. The space cop got it from Xandar apparently. Venom commented. Xandar? Nagant asked. Another planet. Eddie replied. Sleeper reached the onboard computer in his ship and brought up its holographic display, with one of the screens showing the location of the volcano thieves. The mercenaries haven't moved from their location, so we can assume they are injured from our fight. Sleeper explained. So what's stopping us from just going after them? Eddie asked. They're not just going to surrender willingly. They may have injuries but they can still fight and will do so if they feel threatened. We need to capture and restrain them before they can recover their strength. Sleeper replied, Or I could just snipe them from a distance, three shots is all I need to take them out. Nagant suggested, We need them alive, not because the commission told us to, but because we need the information they possess, such as how they knew where to find each piece of the search for the Grendel. Sleeper explained, The Grendel, the giant from the poem of Beowulf. Nagant asked, it's actually an ancient symbiote, an ancestor of ours so to speak, that came to this world ages ago and somehow humanity sealed it away. Venom explained, We're trying to stop them from finding it. Because if they do then that means the Grendel could free Null, evil old god that created the symbiotes. But they turned against him when they realized that they didn't want everything being returned to nothing. Eddie explained, causing Nagant to have a confused but intrigued look. What the fuck have I walked into? Nagant said aloud. Not the Wizard of Oz, that's for sure. Venom remarked. Let us focus on the task at hand, which is ensuring the volcano thieves cannot escape and find the next clue to the Grendel's whereabouts. Sleeper said before observing the holographic screens again. If we could intercept them without alerting them to our presence, it could prevent another battle, and in turn spare more collateral damage. Or I could just shoot them. Nagan said bluntly. We need them to talk. Eddie argued. Who said anything about killing them? Nagant retorted with a sly grin. My rifle arm can fire more than just bullets made of my hair. It can be loaded with other forms of ammunition, including non-lethal ones. So then maybe we could shoot them with tranquilizers. Eddie asked, but where do we find trank darts? Venom added, Sleeper heard their ideas and then began to search the city of Helsinki via his computer. I have multiple matches for the chemical compound found in tranquilizers in Helsinki but the closest source is a veterinary clinic a few miles from our location. So now we're robbing a vet. Fantastic, Eddie said with a groan. Do you have a better solution for getting tranks? Nagant asked with a brow raised. Fair point, Eddie said, scratching his head. We've already broken the law countless times before. I think robbing a vet is the least criminal thing we've done. Venom commented. We'll need to keep a low profile, so I will break in while you keep watch as a lookout. Nagant said to Eddie, And I don't think I need to say this, but keep the black gooey alien inside. I have a name you know. Venom roared. Not my problem. Nagant said with a dry tone. If we're doing this, then we need to go now. Fine, Sleeper can stay here and keep track of their location while we go and get the tranquilizers. Eddie said. That work for everyone. It is acceptable. Sleeper replied with a nod. Then we'll be back as soon as possible. Nagant said as she and Eddie exited the ship as Venom retracted his head back into Eddie's body. Sleeper watched as his comrades darted through the forest and headed back into Helsinki. While the Knight of the Cosmos looked at the holographic screens that showed the volcano thieves' location before he then brought up a communication line and started to speak. This is Sleeper, the mission is still in progress. Targets are currently injured and holding their position. Therefore with the right approach should be apprehended soon. However, there has been a complication to our original plans in the form of a sniper hired by the Hero Public Safety Commission to terminate our targets in spite of their orders to bring them in alive. The commission is undermining our alliance and not treating the possibility of Null's return seriously. When we are done with our mission, we will discuss the terms of our alliance with the commission again. And if they refuse to yield, then we must consider the possibility that the Hero Public Safety Commission, and by extension the pro-heroes serving under them are our enemies. Sleeper spent an hour and half monitoring the Volcano Thieves' location and movements, noticing them not leaving the general area, but pacing or moving around it. 
After several more minutes, the Knight of the Cosmos could hear banter in the distance, though wasn't worried as he knew that it was his allies returning from Helsinki. I honestly expected more security, like a few guards and such. Eddie commented. It's a vets, not the Bank of England. Nagant retorted as she held a bag containing a few vials of liquid tranquilizer. You sure that stuff is gonna work? Venom asked, sprouting out of Eddie's shoulder. It's horse tranquilizer, which is very potent to humans. Nagant replied. A small dose should knock them out without killing them. Wait, are you saying we stole ketamine? Eddie exclaimed. No, don't be ridiculous, this is xylazine, we're not barbarians. Nagant replied with a groan better that than giving them a ketamine addiction. I mean look at Yoda. Venom remarked. Please tell me you haven't been watching those meme compilations again. Eddie said with an annoyed look. When have we had time to look at them while we're here? Plus isn't this earth 200 years in the future or some shit? Venom wondered. Future? Nagant asked, confused. It's a long story. Let's just get back to Sleeper so we can make these trank darts. Eddie said as they soon arrived back at Sleeper's ship. Yo sleeper, we're back with the drugs. Venom roared. No one came after you, therefore I assume you weren't spotted. Sleeper said, turning his head to look at Eddie, Venom and Nagant. Shoplifting is easy compared to assassinating heroes and villains. Nagant said with a shrug before putting the bag of xylazine vials down on a nearby bench. Then let's get to making these darts then. Eddie said, wiping his brow. I assume you have materials for crafting on this vessel of yours. Nagant asked Sleeper. There is an armory in the back of this ship. You can use the materials inside to make those tranquilizer darts. Sleeper replied. Before Nagant then took the bag of xylazine vials and headed straight towards the back of the ship and into the armory. Need any help? Eddie asked, walking towards the armory. No offense, but I don't think making ammunition, even non-lethal ones, is your strong suit. Nagant replied bluntly. Well then what can we do? Venom wondered. If you would like, I could teach you how to manipulate your biomass in more complex ways, as well as assist you in truly unlocking your Codex's Necrosword. Sleeper offered. Help us get stronger. Eddie asked. Correct. Though I can only teach you what is shared between symbiotes, not our unique applications. Sleeper explained. Oh, this is gonna be fun. Venom said with a grin. Well if it helps us get stronger and gives us a better shot at stopping all for one and null, then let's do it. Eddie said with a nod before Venom formed over his body and headed outside of the ship. Sleeper morphed his body into a blob of green and black before seeping through the ship, falling onto the grassy ground outside before forming back into his humanoid shape in front of Venom. Ready to begin. Let's start with some sparring to give your codex a spark of energy. Venom's grin widened before cracking his knuckles. After a few seconds of staring down Sleeper, the two symbiotes then charged at one another each throwing a punch that led to their fists colliding, unleashing a small but noticeable shockwave. Venom weaved his body to the side before trying to hit Sleeper with a kick, but Sleeper blocked it with his elbow then morphed his free arm into a tendril to try and smack Venom with it. Venom ducked out of the tendril's way before firing off a tendril of his own at Sleeper. But the Knight of the Cosmos morphed his body into a pillar-like shape to avoid the tendril, then reformed his humanoid shape and swiped his hand down on Venom cutting him across the chest with claws at the end of his fingertips. Venom growled in pain before looking at the cut marks across his chest, watching the cuts close up before lunging at Sleeper with a flurry of punches. Sleeper swiftly dodged each punch by morphing his body parts to better weave and move around each blow, then formed his necrosword in his right hand and swung it down on Venom. The lethal protector fortunately formed tendrils around his arms then hardened them to block Sleeper's necrosword and then pushed the Knight of the Cosmos back a few feet, then transformed his hardened tendrils into arm blades. I see that you've gotten better with forming complex shapes and weapons with your biomass, as I recall that you could only form one blade before, Sleeper said before taking a defensive stance with his necrosword. We've been getting stronger ever since we arrived in this universe. It was only a matter of time before we figured this trick out. Venom said, then leaped towards Sleeper and slammed his dual blades down, only for Sleeper to block it with his own. Venom and Sleeper began to sword fight, swinging their blades and clashing hardened biomass and biomtal together with enough intensity and force to create sparks upon their blades clashing with each other. Sleeper swung his necrosword higher with the intent to try and hit Venom's head. But Venom ducked out of the way before coiling his arms around his body and then released him in a powerful spin, twirling his arm blades like a spinning top before hitting Sleeper with enough force to knock him into a nearby tree. Sleeper stood back up, his torso having large cut marks in it from Venom's spin attack with his arm blades. Sleeper regenerated from them before picking up his necrosword, which had been knocked out of his hand when he was knocked into the tree, then looked back at Venom. 
You have indeed gotten stronger. When we first fought, I was able to overwhelm you, but now you can not only damage me but also keep pace. Guess that also comes with having a host unlike me. Sleeper explained. But awakening the Necrosword within your codex isn't as simple as forming a blade from your body. Yeah, I noticed, Venom said with snarl before he lunged at Sleeper again and swung his blades at the symbiote. Sleeper blocked once more with his Necrosword, but the force of Venom's attack pushed him back a little. Their lock was broken, and they continued to clash and collide, moving across the ground with impressive speeds as they dueled with their respective blades. Inside the ship, Nagant was currently making the tranquilizer darts, though she glanced outside a few times and watched Venom and Sleeper sparring as she poured the xylazine into the empty darts she made. Those two are quite the beasts when throwing hands. Guess I should be lucky they're my allies. My bullets probably wouldn't have done much given they can just heal from damage. Just what the hell have I gotten myself into, Tsutsumi? Up in the Akashi Mountains, Shigaraki and the League of Villains struggled to keep pace with the walking disaster that was Gigantamasia. For days, they had dodged and tried to attack the behemoth of a villain head-on with their quirks, but the sheer power and strength Makia wielded was too overwhelming. With every strike, the earth shook beneath them while large amounts of debris flew around them and made it difficult to navigate around the attacks of all for one's personal bodyguard. Dabai leaped forward and blasted Gigantamasia with a large wave of blue flames while Spinner threw several knives in the behemoth's direction as well. However, neither fire nor knives could slow down Makia, who rushed forward to try and pulverize them with a powerful left punch. But Spinner and Dabai were quickly pulled out of the way by Magna's magnetism quirk, intercepting the punch with her magnet before trying to repel Gigantamasia back with the opposite polarity. Damn it, this bastard is resisting my quirk's current polarity. He's pushing against it with his raw strength alone. Magni exclaimed. Just keep him busy for a sec. Twice, we need backup right now. Shigaraki shouted as he dodged a few rocks and stone flown about from Makia's movements, then grabbed one with his bare hand, turning it to dust. I'm working on it. I don't feel like it. Twice yelled as he expelled a mud-like substance from his body which formed into three humanoid shapes, becoming duplicates of Dabai, Muscular and Shigaraki. The duplicates rushed into the fray with Muscular's duplicate forming thick layers of muscles on his arms before throwing a flurry of punches at Gigantamasia. But the walking disaster shrugged off each punch before destroying the Muscular duplicate with a powerful kick, bursting into a puddle of mud. The Shigaraki duplicate weaved around a few punches from Makia before lunging both its arms at the behemoth's arm in an attempt to disintegrate it. However, Gigantamasia sprouted large claws from his fingers as well as spikes protruding out of his back and a shield visor on his face before quickly leaping into the ground and digging with impressive speed. He's digging underground, Shigaraki exclaimed in disbelief. Looks like you've managed to force Makia into using one of his other quirks that I gave him. All for one stated. You're telling me this monster has multiple quirks. Like the Namu, Spinner shouted as he kept count of his knives and weapons. To ensure he would be the ultimate bodyguard, I gave Makia several quirks which have turned him into a force of nature with no limits or weakness to hold him back. Gigantamasia is a rare specimen of a human, so unnaturally strong and tough that the doctor and I used him as the template for all Namu. All for one explained, the quirk you saw just now is called Mole. Granting Makia claws and armor that will help him dig and move underground like well, a mole. And how the hell are we supposed to find them? Magni shouted. With patience and focus, my friend. Mr. Compress replied as he surveyed the area around, thinking as to where Makia would pop up from as he played with a few of his compressed marbles. He'll need to surface if he wishes to attack us again. Rumbling was heard across the ground, indicating to the League that Gigantamasia was going to resurface. Rocks and chunks of earth were flung around once more as the ground opened up, large cracks extending from the opening as the mountain shook violently. Gigantamasia emerged from the ground and swung one of his clawed hands at Spinner, only for Mr. Compress to quickly place his hand on the nearest claw, compressing it into one of his marbles and breaking it off from Makia's finger. You took one of his claws off. Nice going. That was terrible. Twice exclaimed after he leaped over another swing from Makia's claws. Fortunately I was close enough to Spinner and compress the claw before he was made into a stage trick gone wrong Mr. Compress said as he and Spinner sprinted out of Makia's range. We can't keep dodging and countering, we need to attack. Shigaraki yelled as he vaulted over some debris and then plunged his hands into the ground, causing it to slowly turn grey around him as the earth was turned to dust. Not sure how the hell we're supposed to do that given he's been kicking our asses every time we've tried to fight him. Spinner yelled as he threw more knives at Makia's direction, only for the knives to bounce off of the behemoth once more. 
Gigantamacia deactivated the mole quirk before he let out a colossal roar, generating a shockwave that blew some of the League members further away. Twice then sent his Dabai and Shigaraki duplicates after Makia, with the Dabai duplicate unleashing a barrage of blue fireballs and the Shigaraki duplicate leaping onto one of the behemoth's legs and dug into it with his hands, slowly trying to disintegrate it. Not enough it's still not enough. Your too weak Gigantamacia screamed as he swiftly picked up the Shigaraki duplicate and crushed it into mud with his left hand. Good thing that wasn't you, boss, Dabai said to Shigaraki mockingly causing the leader of the League of Villains to grit his teeth in anger. Using her quirk and giant magnet, Magni pulled Mr. Compress and Dabai away from a backhand swipe from Gigantamacia. Magni tried once more to counter Makia's attack with her magnet, trying to repel their arm. But before the walking disaster finally overpowered them, and with a strong swipe of his hand, took the top half of Magna's body clean off, spraying blood and visceral matter in each direction as Shigaraki and the others looked at their fallen comrade in horror. Magni, no. Spinner screamed in both sadness and anger. This is unexpected Mr. Compress said in a solemn tone. Not big sis Magni. Toga's gonna be pissed when she finds out. Twice exclaimed before looking at all for one. Hey what gives, all for one? Are you trying to get us killed? Go ahead, bring it on. If Magni was killed by such a simple attack from Gigantamacia, then that means she simply was too weak and unfit to be part of the League of Villains. All for one retorted. But she was our friend. I never liked her. Twice shouted back, switching demeanors. Friendship can only take you so far. Twice, especially in this superpower-dominated society. In this world, the strongest reign supreme and can do as they please, and the weak exist to either serve the strong or to be wiped out to pave the way for the new generation. All for one explained, remember that all of you agreed to my training regimen, and you should take your comrade's death as a lesson in what you must rise above. If I were to compare you all to something, right now you are growing caterpillars, feasting on leaves and storing up energy to trigger your metamorphosis as you proceed to make a chrysalis. But Magni, she refuses to build a chrysalis and believed she could take on the giant and powerful beast as she was, a caterpillar still in the midst of growth. Will you share her fate or will you build your chrysalis so that you can become the butterflies that were meant to be? Yeah but twice was about to say, only for Shigaraki to place a hand on his shoulder, touching it with only three of his fingers. Magni made her choice, just like everyone else here did. Her death will spur us on, and we'll continue to grow for her sake and the rest of the comrades we've lost. Shigaraki said before looking at Gigantamacia. I'll admit, none of us can beat this monster at our level. Shigaraki took his hand off twice as he clenched his fist and held it within his other hand, glaring at Makia with his sharp red eyes as strands of his hair became pure white. But we'll keep on improving, until we break our limits. All for one let out a large grin and stretched out both his arms in an elegant fashion. Then let us continue, for I shall fashion these rusty blades you call villains into magnificent swords. Carry on, Makia, destroy the weakness within their body and mind. All for one commanded as Gigantamacia stood up tall and prepared for another onslaught. The sun had once again set on Japan, and for a certain young serial killer and her alien symbiote, it was time to head back home. Toby used Carnage's power to leap between the tree lines as she swiftly moved through the forest to reach her objective. Well, I'll give you this, today was quite the feast Carnage remarked. More tasty blood to drink and more targets off Shigaraki's list. Toga said before leaping between a few trees and then landed in a clearing where she could see the League's new base in the distance. It helps to also power up so that the next time we see my old man, we can finish the job. Carnage snarled. Maybe if the doc let us out more, but I know he's going to probably have us do more tests again once we rest up. Toga said with a sigh as Carnage's biomass went back into her body as she slowly walked towards the base. And those Yakuza chumps, why does all for one need them? Carnage asked. You heard them. They have a way to cancel out quirks apparently, and I guess who wouldn't want the ability to do that? Toga replied. Does that worry you? The idea that someone can take away your quirk? Carnage asked. A little. But I'm sure they wouldn't do that, especially now that I'm stuck with you, little Miss Alien Baby Mama. Toga said teasingly. Don't remind me, Carnage said with a sour tone as they arrived back at the League's base. Hey guys, we're back, Toga called out, gaining the attention of the other members of the League of Villains, who had a more grim and solemn expression on their faces. Evening ladies, how did it go? Mr. Compress asked in a more composed manner. Child's play, it was easy taking out those Ketsubutsu kids, just had to transform into the right person so they would let their guard down Toga replied with a sinister grin before holding up four vials of blood. Whoa, you got more blood samples. That's impressive, I could do better. Twice remarked, shifting between demeanors once again. 
Toga and Carnage had begun to notice the negativity in the air, and Toga especially felt like someone was missing in their group. The answer then crosses Toga's mind. Where's Magni? Wasn't she with you when you left? Toga asked with a concerned tone. She was but she was killed earlier today Spinner replied somberly. What? The big sis Magni is dead. This? This can't be happening. Toga exclaimed as she started to panic. Sorry to say. But this is all true, Toga Mr. Compress said. Magni died trying to become stronger for the League, for all of us. She gave her life so we could all have a fighting chance, a chance to grow and evolve as villains. We'll carry on her dream, Toga, Shigaraki said, leaning against a wall. But in other news, it sounds like you've had a winning streak. Though I do wonder how you've been able to accomplish all of this in spite of the schools banding together to better protect their students. That's where I come in, a little trick I picked up from my brother, he was quite the hacker. Carnage explained, sprouting out of Toga's shoulder. I just jack into their computers if the target is inside or close to the school, then disable the cameras and motion sensors. And what about the pro heroes who are teachers at the schools? Wouldn't they have seen you or been on patrol? Mr. Compress asked. What do you think I've been doing with the blood samples I've gathered? I turned into students I've taken blood from and they're none the wiser. Toga explained. It helps that when I eat their brains, I can see into their memories and just feed that info into Toga's head, giving her the perfect alibi. Carnage said with a grin. Well, color me impressed, my dear. A sinister but calm voice said. Toga, Shigaraki and the others looked towards the source of the voice, seeing it was all for one who clapped slowly upon hearing the Blood Hunter duo's accomplishments. Master, you've returned, Shigaraki said, bowing slightly. Yes, my visit to the Shai Hasekai's stronghold was a learning experience to say the least. Once the Volcano Thieves have the information we require, we will be relocating alongside the Shai Hasekai. All for one explained, the League and those Yakuza guys, under the same roof. Spinner questioned, they are our allies after all, and therefore we should have their back as they work on the quirk-destroying formula. All for one replied. Meanwhile, mine and the good doctor's work with Toga and Carnage will continue as scheduled. Carnage visibly flinched and cringed upon hearing all for one's words while Toga just gave a look of discomfort but acceptance, realizing how futile it is to resist. You mentioned the volcano thieves before. I presume you hired them for something related to your plans. Mr. Compress asked. Correct, Mr. Compress, they are searching for something that my benefactor is very interested in finding. It's just a matter of time before they complete their task. Shigaraki listened to his master's words subconsciously as he kept explaining and clarifying his plans to the League, but he still found himself contemplating what all for one's benefactor's true motives are. Ever since his master reappeared after his sudden disappearance during his battle with All Might, Shigaraki felt as though that All for One wasn't the same as the one he grew up under. But after a couple of minutes, he then dismissed these thoughts and continued to listen to All for One. About an hour had passed since the volcano thieves had discovered where to go in order to locate the Grendel. Though the three of them were still sitting around inside of the old farmhouse, resting up so that they could fully use their quirks once again. Unbeknownst to them however, Eddie and Venom along with Sleeper were just outside, both of them moving towards the farmhouse on opposite sides of each other. Meanwhile, Lady Nagant positioned herself up on a nearby hill and waited for her allies to make their move in capturing the volcano thieves. Nagant sat herself down while turning her arm into its rifle form, her bipod tendrils touching the ground and then took aim as she loaded one of the tranquilizer darts in the barrel of the firearm. Let's hope this works, Nagant thought as she looked through her rifle's scope, spotting the volcano thieves inside of the farmhouse, then spoke through her comms. I've got eyes on the targets inside the farmhouse. I'm ready when you two are. We're approaching the farmhouse's gate. Sleeper spoke through the comms, ready to bag and tag. Venom quipped. Seriously, you just had to say it, Eddie said with an annoyed tone. Focus, Sleeper said sternly, making the lethal protector duo silent. Lady Nagant meanwhile rolled her eyes after Venom's remark then continued to stare down the scope on her arm. She could see the volcano thieves were in the middle of the farmhouse, trading banter with one another as Venom and Sleeper inched closer to their objective. Kazutani, status on your leg. Volcano asked as he adjusted some of the tubes and wiring in his gauntlet. I can walk with it again, boss, so that's a plus. Dust Boy replied with a grin, standing up from his seat though started to flinch slightly, gritting his teeth in pain. Well, it still hurts but at least I'm not limping anymore. Good the sooner we find this manuscript for all for one, the better. Dusty Ash said while twirling her tanto around, before putting it back in the sheath. Oh, I already have been crunching the numbers. Crunching the numbers? Gus Boy asked, confused. She means money, you moron. Volcano said with a groan. So, how much? 300 million yen. 
Dusty Ash replied excitedly, shooting one arm up into the air while lifting one leg behind her. Whoa, that's quite a price you've set, Heizono. Gus Boy exclaimed, his eyes widening in surprise. That's quite the number, though I'm sure the big bad symbol of evil has enough bank accounts to cover that cost. Volcano said, before readjusting his gauntlet. He was the dark king of the criminal underworld, so you'd expect him to be loaded. Dusty Ash said with a giggle as she put her arm and leg back down and gave the two of them a wink. Nagant, do you have a clear shot? Sleeper asked through the comms as he reached the shed near the farmhouse. I do, and I'm ready to fire. Lady Nagant replied, having her rifle aimed at Volcano's chest. Take the shot, Sleeper said, before summoning his necrosword and prepared for battle. Lady Nagant then exhaled and held her breath before firing her rifle. The tranquilizer dart flew through the air at supersonic speeds, through an open hole in a farmhouse window and struck Volcano on his chest, much to their shock and horror. What the fuck? Dusty Ash exclaimed as she took her sword and micro Yuzi, taking cover behind the large doors of the farmhouse. Are you okay, boss? Meanwhile, Volcano looked down at where he was shot at and saw a dart sticking out his chest. He growled and yanked out the dart, throwing it on the ground. That bitch found us. Scatter, Volcano ordered. Dusty Ash put on her respirator then emitted a dust cloud from her body, only big enough to cover the windows that were on the side that the dart came from. Gust Boy then ran towards the other side of the farmhouse, ready to use his fans. I've lost visual of the targets. Dusty Ash used her quirk to cover the windows. Lady Nagant relayed through comms after she loaded another dart into her rifle. Shit. Eddie and Venom yelled in unison as they charged towards the farmhouse, only to narrowly dodge a powerful lava blast that shot out of one of the windows. Venom, don't engage Volcano head on. Sleeper yelled before he moved quickly to intercept Gus Boy. Gus Boy however spotted Sleeper approaching and began to spin his hands, unleashing a powerful torrent of air. Sleeper formed tendrils and anchored his body to the ground preventing Gus Boy's attack from knocking him further away from his targets. This alien freak is anchoring himself to the ground. I can't blow him away, Gus Boy shouted. Well then allow me to help you with that. Dusty Ash called out as she then ran towards Gus Boy, shooting a burst of rounds from her micro Uzi at Sleeper and shot a stream of dust to combine with Gus Boy's attack. Sleeper used his necrosword to block each of the bullets, then switched to inferred vision to see through the cloud of dust fired at him. He then leaped through the dust cloud and swung his necrosword down on Dusty Ash, who only managed to just block his blade with hers before Sleeper was blown into the shed by Gus Boy, crashing into a few boxes and tools. You okay, Ash? Gus Boy asked his comrade. I'm all good, Dusty Ash replied. Nagant, we need to tag the other two mercs fast while the first dart takes effect. Eddie said within venom and through the calms. Volcano then rushed out of the farmhouse, furiously unleashing a volley of lava blasts at Venom who dodged each attack before leaping into the air and drop-kicked Volcano into one of the farmhouse's walls. We've got this hot bastard. Focus on the duck and the stripper. Venom roared. Lady Nagant quickly aimed her rifle at Gus Boy as she saw that he stood still long enough. She then took her shot and hit Gus Boy on his waist. Ugh, I'm hit, I'm hit. Gus Boy screamed, falling to the ground and grasping his waist in an exaggerated manner. You only just got shot with a dart, dumbass. Now get up. Dusty Ash yelled as she fired more rounds at Sleeper before creating another large dust cloud from her body. Sleeper sprinted out of the farmhouse's shed, shrugging off the bullets fired at him before he launched a few tendrils at Gus Boy and Dusty Ash, to which she dodged or deflected with her tanto. And Gus Boy tried to spin his hands, but two of the tendrils grabbed his arms and pulled him towards Sleeper. Let go of me, you oversized blob. Gus Boy yelled as he spun his hands again. And though it didn't break Sleeper's hold, it launched the mercenary into the air. Oh shit. Sleeper then yanked the tendrils and slammed Gus Boy head first into the ground, knocking him out cold. Dusty Ash grit her teeth after seeing her comrade get taken down, she put her gun away, and then charged at Sleeper, slashing at him multiple times once she got close enough. But Sleeper was able to keep pace and blocked each of her swings then counter-attacked with an upward strike. Dusty Ash blocked it just in time but it was still strong enough to send her flying back a dozen feet away from Sleeper. Volcano. Dust Boy is down. Dusty Ash shouted before landing in a way that minimized the impact and quickly raised her tanto back up in a guarding position. She also quickly scanned the area and saw Lady Nagant. I also spotted Lady Nagant. She's up on the hill. Deal with her while I take on these freaks. Volcano yelled before blasting a volley of lava at Venom, who just managed to dodge the blast yet again. 
Without saying another word, Dusty Ash nodded and ran towards Lady Nagant's position while reloading her micro Uzi. Afterwards, she used her quirk to shoot out a large cloud of dust in front of herself, but as soon as she did so, Lady Nagant fired the last dart at her before she could be fully concealed. Dusty Ash only felt a dart hitting her shoulder after failing to block it with her tanto. Shit, she thought as she kept running through her dust cloud and taking out the dart. That fucking stings, but it's still best to take this bitch down before the drug takes effect on me. I've tagged all of our targets with the tranquilizers, Lady Nagant informed through comms. Take care of the female mercenary, Venom and I will handle Volcano, Sleeper said through the comms as he headed towards Venom and Volcano's location. Understood, Lady Nagan said before loading up one of her hair bullets into her rifle, waiting patiently for Dusty Ash to run straight out of the cloud of dust while looking down the sights of her scope. A few more seconds passed but then she briefly felt the air currents and the sounds of bullets whizzing right by her, causing Nagant to duck down a bit to avoid getting hit. Lady Nagant still couldn't see the white-haired villainess, but she did notice the dust cloud being slightly dispersed from the gunfire. She then took aim once more, being sure to keep track of her breathing while also predicting where Dusty Ash could be hiding within the dust cloud. There you are, Lady Nagant thought as she settled on where to shoot and then fired her rifle, hearing Dusty Ash scream along with some gunfire from her micro Uzi. She then saw Dusty Ash tumbling out the side of the dust cloud, letting go of her gun and tanto and ended up lying down on the ground shortly afterwards. Lady Nagant changed her arm back to normal before going down to meet Dusty Ash face to face. Dusty Ash herself meanwhile tried to stand up as she saw the female sniper quickly running towards her, but ended up stumbling as she was hit in the leg. She quickly scanned the area for her weapons and shuffled towards her micro Uzi as fast as she could. And she did end up grabbing it and leaned up to fire at Lady Nagant. However, the former pro hero was already in front of her and immediately disarmed her with a roundhouse kick to her right hand. You buy. Dusty Ash was about to shout but then Lady Nagant followed up her kick with a hard punch that landed on the right side of Dusty Ash's head, knocking her out. Dusty Ash has been taken care of, Nagant said through the comms before putting restraints on Dusty Ash then lifted her off the ground and started to watch the fight. Now we just have to cool this hot head down, Venom roared. Venom leaped over a lava blast from Volcano before forming an arm blade and slammed it down on the mercenary, who blocked it with his gauntlet. Sleeper rushed over to Venom and Volcano and swung his necrosword at Volcano, who sidestepped out of the way as he released his hold on Venom. Volcano lifted his gauntlet-clad arm to the sky as steam and smoke erupted from his shoulder volcanoes. Volcanon. As Volcano screamed his attack name, he blasted several jets of lava into the air that rained down upon the farmhouse and its surrounding area like a volcanic eruption. Venom and Sleeper both swiftly dodged and weaved around each blast of lava before the two symbiotes rushed towards Volcano and tackled him to the ground before they wound up their arms and double-punched him square in the face, knocking the leader of the Volcano Thieves out cold. Looks like we got them, Eddie said as half of Venom's face opened up to reveal his host's own, then turned to look at Sleeper. Guess we just take them back to the ship now. Affirmative, Sleeper said as he approached the unconscious volcano and lifted him over his shoulder. Venom then walked over to the unconscious Gust Boy and picked him up with both hands. He really does look like a duck, Venom said with a chuckle. While he's not a duck, his quirk doesn't even have anything to do with ducks. Eddie retorted. So why the long face? Venom asked, causing Eddie to groan in frustration at the symbiote's play on words. After a couple of seconds, Sleeper along with Eddie and Venom could see Lady Nagant walking towards them while dragging Dusty Ash with her. Well, that's these mercs taken care of. When they wake up, it will be time to get some information. Agreed, but I believe it would be ill-advised to kill them afterwards. The commission has shown us that they refuse to trust me and my kind, therefore bringing them in alive and giving them to the authorities should send a message. Sleeper stated. And what message would that be? Nagant asked. We're not monsters. We can show restraint even when it would be easier to simply take their lives. Sleeper replied. Lady Nagant only hummed and nodded at Sleeper's response. Sleeper began slapping special cuffs on Volcano and Gust Boy's hands, restraining their unconscious selves. But once they were about to make their way back to the ship Eddie and Lady Nagant started to feel off balance. What the hell? Eddie and Venom said in a lethargic tone, and Venom himself put a hand on the side of his head. What's happening? Sleeper asked, noticing the three's behavior. We feel like we've chugged a dozen beers, Venom said, as his face opened up and Eddie proceeded to vomit on the ground. You're in a state of vertigo. 
But how? Sleeper questioned as he started to pick up something on his sensors. That must be someone's quirk Nagant replied as she stumbled and lost a hold of dusty ash. But who who could have found out about us? Hick that would be that would be us. A male voice with slurred speech replied. The group then turned to see two men walking towards them. One of them was tall and muscular with giant gauntlets and a plague doctor's mask that was colored black with red lines. He also wore a black tank top, olive green jeans and orange sneakers. The second man had long, greasy black hair and was much shorter and skinnier than his comrade, though he was somewhat muscular as well. He was sporting a furry vest along with dark pants and black shoes, and his mask was white with drains for the eye holes. But they also saw him drinking a bottle of alcohol, but some of it was dribbling down his mouth and onto himself or the ground. Who the hell are these? Masked assholes. Eddie said, I don't know but we need to deal with them. Nagant said then she brought out her rifle and shot at the man drinking alcohol, but she missed her shot. The alcoholic took out a few knives from under his vest and threw them straight at Lady Nagant. But as she tried to avoid them, she grunted in pain as one blade managed to pierce the barrel of her rifle. One managed to cut her on her waist, and two other blades were lodged in her shoulder. Oh she's quite feisty isn't Hick isn't she? The skinny man in the white mask and fur vest chuckled, dropping his now empty bottle and picking up dusty ash. I thought these guys were meant to be the best. The muscular guy with the plague doctor mask said, picking up Volcano and Gus Boy. Well remember Hick remember that we're only here to assist the mercs in case Hick in case this was to happen to them. The skinny alcoholic stated, and it seemed like they needed us Hick after all. Hey give those back you mother Venom tried to say, but lost balance and fell over. Try not to move while the quirk's ability is still in effect. Sleeper said, moving about with zero difficulty. What the hick how are you still moving? The masked alcoholic asked in confusion. It seems that this quirk only works on terrestrial organisms with developed organs. I have no such organs in my biomass, not ones that would be plagued by intoxication. Not unless I was bonded to a host like you are. Sleeper replied, looking at the dazed Venom. I can still help to stop them Lady Nagant stated as she took out the knife that was blocking the barrel of her rifle. Hick, it seems as though you're also able to resist no matter we're only here to extract the volcano thieves anyway. The masked alcoholic stated, before just barely evading a tendril from Sleeper. He then took out a couple more knives with his free hand and then threw them at Sleeper, before he and the larger man began to run away while carrying the volcano thieves. Sleeper weaved around the knives, quickly closing the distance between them and tackled the masked alcoholic to the ground. The muscular one then put the unconscious volcano and Gus Boy under one of his arms before turning around and gripping on Sleeper's shoulder tightly. Then an orange aura began flowing from Sleeper's body towards the muscular man, who looked to be inhaling the aura. Not only that, but he began to get taller and his muscles were getting larger. What the F? Venom yelled. He got bigger. Eddie exclaimed, as Venom did his best to stay on his feet. Get lost, freak. The larger man shouted as he then lifted Sleeper off the ground and tossed him into the farmhouse. Sleeper crashed through one of the walls, but quickly reformed himself and stood up before creating some sort of firearm-like appendage on his arm and started to fire at the two masked villains with small acidic projectiles. The larger man dived towards the unconscious members of the volcano thieves, avoiding all but two shots of Sleeper's projectiles, grunting and roaring in pain as he felt their acidic touch. Damn it! The larger man yelled as he proceeded to use his quirk again, absorbing the stamina and vitality of Sleeper once more. Lady Nagant, who was trying to keep her aim steady the whole time under the effect of the alcoholic's quirk, finally took her shot as she felt the time was right, and this time she managed to land a shot on the alcoholic's arm, causing him to let go of the knives he had in his hand. However, Nagant grunted as she felt the barrel from her rifle arm crack under pressure from where the knife penetrated. The skinnier man endured the pain and then threw a few more knives at Sleeper and Lady Nagant using his other hand. The former pro hero dashed to the side to avoid them while Sleeper simply created holes in his body that the knives slipped through as he lunged at the masked drunkard, only for the larger man to step in front of his comrade and used a powerful right hook to send him skidding across the ground. That hulking brute his quirk seems to draw power from others, like an energy siphon no wonder I feel weaker, and light-headed sleeper thought, as he used his claws to halt his body mid-skid and quickly stood back up. We're wasting time fighting these freaks, let's grab the volcano thieves and get the fuck out of here. The larger man yelled as he scooped up volcano and gust boy. I was thinking the same thing, the alcoholic said before lifting dusty ash and began fleeing the area alongside his comrade. As the two masked felons got further away from the farmhouse, the drunkard's quirk faded away, to which Venom was able to stand up again. 
Lady Nagant sighed as she saw them run off and transformed her arm back to normal. Shit, they got away Eddie said as Venom retracted back into his body, panting from exhaustion. No one said anything about them having backup. The commission nor myself were aware of them. Nagant stated, all for one must have sent them to ensure the volcano thieves completed their job. Sleeper said before looking at his scanner again. So they weren't kidding when they said the boogeyman of Hero Society was involved. Nagant sighed. We need to chase them down before they get too far away. Not with those injuries, Sleeper said, observing the incisions and cuts on Lady Nagant's arm, waist, and shoulder. Those look nasty. Maybe we should stop for a little while and catch our breaths, Eddie said with visible discomfort, still feeling the effects of one of the mask assailant's quirks. Damn it, Eddie, sit down before you puke again. Venom roared as he forced Eddie's body to sit down on a nearby bale of hay. I can still track their location. We will be able to follow them regardless of how far they travel using my ship. Perhaps it is best we use this time to recover and rethink our strategy. Sleeper suggested. All right, Nagant said with a nod before she glanced at her wounds on her right arm, waist, and then to her shoulder, which was trickling with a small flow of blood. Just when we thought we had them, those masked assholes had to show up and ruin things. Venom roared as he protruded out of Eddie's shoulder. Easy on the yelling. My head is still spinning from that guy's quirk Eddie complained, grasping the temple of his head. When is this wild goose chase going to end? When we catch them and prevent them from reviving the Grendel. Threat not, Edward Brock. For once we succeed, the Collective can assist you in returning to your universe. Sleeper assured. So they have a way to cross between universes then? Eddie asked, no, but they know someone who can show you. Sleeper replied, but first we gotta save this world. Eddie and everyone on it except for the bad guys, they can just get eaten for all I care. Venom remarked. Lady Nagant chuckled at Venom's remark as she found it rather amusing, and that surprised both Eddie and Venom. Was that a laugh they heard? Eddie asked with a brow raised. Sounds like it to me, Eddie. Venom said with a grin. I have no idea what you're talking about, Nagin said playfully before she sat down on another hay bale and looked off in the distance, thinking about her contract with the commission. Just how many more lies and deceptions have you got up your sleeve, you corporate assholes? Overhaul's week had been eventful to say the least. He was given the order from all for one to create more quirk destroyers, which meant doubling his work efforts and utilizing Eri's flesh and blood even more. However, yesterday, Yuri escaped from the Shai Hasekai's headquarters, forcing the young Yakuza to pursue her. This in turn led to an encounter with two heroes in training who Yuri ran into, running the risk of their plans being discovered. And since then, Overhaul was getting more suspicious that heroes in the nearby area were catching up to him, fearing what all for one would do should he be captured or unable to meet his quota. Damn those brats, had Yuri not piped down when I told her to, our base and operations could have been compromised. All for one had me send two of the eight bullets to shadow the volcano thieves as they search for their prize. He's yet to reveal to me who his benefactor is, but I will find out one way or another, it's just a matter of time. Overhaul thought as he walked down the hall towards the meeting room, before reaching the door and entering the room. Inside of the meeting room there was a wall of multiple computer screens and inside of the room stood all for one. Shigaraki, Dr. Garaki, Kurajiri, Chronostasis, Namoto, and Mimic. Apologies, I hope I'm not too late, Overhaul said in a formal tone. Oh no, you're just on time, Overhaul. All for one said with a smile. How is production on the latest batch of quirk destroyers? I have harvested the necessary amount of extract, enough to make twice as many capsules and bullets, Overhaul replied. But how do you intend to give your gnomus the power of a quirk destroyer without nullifying their own quirks? That's where the symbiotes come in, Dr. Garaki answered. The clinter bonded and grafted to its host will possess the quirk destroyer within their biomass, independent from the Namu's own anatomy and biology. Once we ensure that only a single consciousness remains within the Namu symbiote hybrid, we can therefore order it to take specific actions, including firing off a quirk destroyer at their target. Just imagine the look on the heroes' faces when they encounter the Namu symbiotes, and then in the blink of an eye, their precious quirk is gone and there would be nothing stopping our creations from devouring every pro in the country. All for one said with a sinister grin. Sounds like a twisted Frankenstein's monster if you ask me Chronostasis said half-heartedly, causing Shigaraki to shoot a glare at the Yakuza. Remember your place, Yakuza dog. My master chose to spare you instead of just killing all of you one by one. If his and the doctor's plan works, then we'll be able to destroy this rotten world. 
Shigaraki said, placing a hand on Chronostasi's shoulder, touching it with only four of his fingers. Let go of my shoulder, Chronostasi said uncomfortably. Take your hand off my subordinate. Shigaraki, we may work under all for one but the chain of command in the Shai Hasekai is shadowed by me. Overhaul said, glaring back at Shigaraki. Shigaraki looked at Chronostasis before letting out a dark cackle as he let go of Chronostasis' shoulder, allowing the masked Yakuza to have a moment of relief, being glad Shigaraki didn't put down his fifth finger. Anyway, there are two other things I would like to discuss with you today. Overhaul stated to All for One. First off, ever since Ari had run into those two heroes in training the other day, I've been getting suspicious that pro heroes nearby are starting to investigate the area. Are you serious? Shigaraki scoffed. If the pros discover your work, this whole operation will go up in smoke. Calm yourself, Tamura. I had foreseen this outcome as the Shai Hasekai are directly and indirectly related to several purchases and use of trigger. Therefore, it would have only been a matter of time before the authorities would have mounted an investigation. All for one explained. It's quite simple. We must relocate the Shai Hasekai and their operations elsewhere, a place that is hidden and guarded well. Sounds like you already have a place in mind. Overhaul remarked. Of course, no need to use any money from your own pockets. I do take care of my own after all. All for one said before turning around to face the multiple screens on the wall which all turned on. Your compound is currently located in a suburb in Osaka, giving you plenty of distance from major hero agencies and allows you to keep your operations quiet. But now that the authorities have wised up, they will eventually uncover the location of your compound. So where do you propose we go? Overhaul asked. North, in Hokkaido. One of my hideouts from back in the early days is located there and shall be the perfect base of operations for both the League of Villains and Shai Hasekai. It's been renovated to house an entire army, and the good doctor has had an underground facility built below it. Big and sturdy enough for experimentation and research. All for one replied. I have already relocated much of my research and specimens to the Hokkaido facility, and I've had some success with Carnage's reproduction cycle. Dr. Garaki said, so she has conceived offspring. Overhaul asked curiously, all for one has been generous enough to inform me of your contribution to this army he seeks to build. Well I guess it can't be helped, best you understand what we seek to merge with the Namu after all. Dr. Garaki replied with a shrug. Come by the lab later and see for yourself, Kaichisaki. My name is Overhaul, the Yakuza boss said with a venomous tone. But of course, Dr. Garaki chuckled. But speaking of the lab, I should return to it. This Namu symbiote army isn't going to make itself. That's one issue taken care of, I guess. Overhaul sighed. However, there is something else I wish to discuss with you, all for one, in private. Shigaraki, you and Kirajiri can assist the rest of the Shai Hasekai with the relocation process. All for one said, but master, Kirajiri can surely handle this task alone. Shigaraki argued, Kirajiri is indeed powerful and capable of warping them and their resources safely to Hokkaido, but the pro heroes are after them as we speak and they'll need someone to shadow them. I can't afford to lose the girl and the quirk destroyers. All for one stated, I understand, Master, Shigaraki said with a nod as he gestured for Kirajiri to follow him out of the room, who followed obediently. The three of you can join them as well, Overhaul said. Are you sure, boss? Nemoto asked. Yes, now leave us, Overhaul replied sternly to which Chronostasis, Nemoto, and Mimic also exited the room, then made eye contact with all for one. I'm going to come out and say it, you still haven't let me meet your benefactor yet. I had a feeling you would bring that up again. All for one said, adjusting his collar. I have to warn you, overhaul, contact with my benefactor is not an easy accomplishment to complete. What are you trying to say, all for one, that I haven't done enough for you yet? Overhaul challenged as he clenched his fingers. Well then, tell me what else this is going to take in order to meet him. You misunderstand my words, overhaul. I am telling the truth that speaking with him is no easy task, how a single mistake, any notion of hesitation will melt your precious brain into paste. All for one explained as he stuck out his index finger, with a small black tendril coming out of the tip. What the hell are you going to do to me? Overhaul exclaimed, instinctively backing away into his seat. Well, you wanted to meet my benefactor, didn't you? All you have to do is connect your brain into the symbiote hive mind. All for one instructed. The what? Overhaul said in confusion. The symbiotes aren't just bonded to their host, they are all connected to a massive neurological and metaphysical construct made from billions of years of knowledge and memories passed on across time and space by their kind. Through connecting to it like I have, you shall be able to meet my benefactor. All for one explained. So, you're telling me that your benefactor is a symbiote as well? Overhaul asked. The answer to your question is right here. 
all for one said as the tendril coiled around overhaul. Word of advice, don't fight it, just let it in. He tried to break free of the tendril's grasp, but he could hardly move at all before feeling a sudden sting on the back of his head. Then shortly after, the Yakuza boss felt an overwhelming sensation throughout his entire mind as his consciousness shot down a stream of cosmic neurons. Countless information spanning across billions of light years and across different universes flowing through it. His head was twitching and jerking around sporadically during that time. All this information came so suddenly and was passing by so quickly, Overhaul felt as though his brain was about to explode at any moment, as he gritted his teeth in pain. King in black, Overhaul heard these ominous words in his head, in which the multitude of colors, images and information racing across the symbiote hive mind silenced as the Yakuza's mind was enveloped in darkness. It pulled him in and sent him towards the source. Deep underground, within one of the small rooms in the Hokkaido compound used for Dr. Garaki's experiments and research was Himiko Toga, laying on a bed in the fetal position as a mix of emotions raced through her mind. There was pain, anger, sadness and a feeling of vulnerability overwhelming Toga, but Carnage however was silent for a long time, something that disturbed the young blood-sucking villain. Carnage was usually very talkative and opinionated, but the blood hunter was now quiet and docile. Carnage, Toga asked, finally deciding to speak up. Carnage, are you there? But Carnage didn't say anything, causing Toga to let out a sigh of concern and frustration. Carnage, please, you can't stay silent forever. You're tougher than this, you've cleaved through cops and heroes alike with a smile on your face, you've fought your dad to a standstill. We're stuck together and we feel what each other feels, no one else is like that just please talk to me. What's there to talk about how they pumped us full of nasty chemicals, shocked us, threatened us with fire, and sound as I gave birth to little monsters. Carnage finally spoke in a solemn and defeated tone of voice. Your species always talks about the beauty of childbirth, how amazing and wonderful creating life is but where is the beauty in forcing me to breed weapons where? Toga. I don't know Toga replied after a few seconds of silence. You and everyone might see me, might see all of my kind as weapons, as monsters who eat and kill to their heart's content but we have emotions. We learn them from our hosts you have taught me a lot about the wonders of killing and blood but I also feel like there's a loneliness to you. That you still don't know where you belong and you just want friends. You want people to relate with maybe I do too but I don't think dad or that space cop want a psychopath for a friend Carnage said, still in a solemn tone, not loud and assertive like usual. Toga sat up and looked at the edge of the bed, thinking about what Carnage had just said before letting out another sigh. I know how you feel at least in regard to people not liking you not liking you for enjoying violence, and blood for wanting to be like the people you love to want to be inside of them as they draw their final breath, or maybe it's all just pointless and meaningless, and that we just don't belong in society look, I don't know, I'm just as clueless as you. Clueless? I'm not clueless, I'm in pain and confused but I know that they don't care about this part of me only the killer, the monster why else would they want a blood hunter? Carnage said with a sigh. However, both of their thoughts were abruptly interrupted with a sudden feeling of pain that flowed through them. Toby used one hand to rub her head to try and ease the pain pulsating in her head, while also hearing Carnage groan, as she especially was affected by this sensation. But not too long afterwards, the pain had gone away. That Yakuza guy Carnage said, What about him? Toga asked. He's now connected to the symbiote hive mind Carnage replied. All for one jacked him in. Is he letting him meet? Toga asked before trailing off. Looks like it another puppet for the king in black carnage answered with a concerned tone. And from what you told me, the world or any world for that matter is going to die Toga said, looking up at the flickering light bulb above her. Maybe, maybe we should try to escape. What? As much as I want to get out of here, they know our every step and move. They are monitoring us every time we leave this room carnage argued. Maybe they do, but I know that that maybe the two of us can figure it out Toga admitted, surprising Carnage. The two of us dot you mean together, like before, Carnage asked. No but maybe it can be better than before if you're willing to trust me again Toga replied. Carnage remained silent for a few seconds before letting out a groan. She then protruded out of Toga's shoulder and let out a quiet shriek. Fine, I'll follow your lead. Now hurry up and show us how to get out of here. Toga let out a yawn and stretched her arms behind her back. She then stood up and looked at each of the walls before looking at the ceiling, spying a ventilation shaft above. Bingo she said before reaching towards the ventilation shaft's grate, and used carnage to form four small tendrils, quickly unscrewing each of the screws before taking the grate off and climbing through the vent. This is a little cliché, Toga Carnage said skeptically. There are no cameras in the vents, therefore they can't precisely pinpoint our location. Toga explained as she carefully moved through the ventilation shaft. But they did put a tracker inside me. 
Farnage said, forming tendrils around Tova's body which clung to the vent's walls and slipped her body through each pathway. Using your special vision powers, I was able to scope out these air vents as we walked through each of the wallways between missions and experiments. The path I'm taking us should lead into a warehouse where some of the Gnomus are in stasis, Toga explained. And you're sure they won't wake up? Carnage asked. They're controlled like a drone, they'll only wake up when told to. Toga replied. Toga and Carnage continued to crawl through the vents of the hideout as fast as they could, following the path Toga envisioned in her head. Toga soon found the grate which led to the Namu's warehouse and used Carnage's tendrils to unscrew the grate from the outside, which fell off and made a quiet clanging sound as it hit the metal floor below. This is it, there are a few cameras in the warehouse, but we can sabotage them if we can get to the fuse box nearby. Toga explained. All right, let's go. Carnage said in agreement, as Toga narrowly moved in between the blind spots of each camera. Carnage's eyes formed over Toga's, allowing her to use the Blood Hunter's special vision to locate the fuse box. As soon as they set their eyes upon it, Toga quickly rushed over to the fuse box. However, the blood-sucking shapeshifter was suddenly grabbed from behind by what felt like a tendril. Toga then turned to face her attacker. It was a Namu that resembled a gorilla with four glowing yellow eyes coming out of its brain, two metallic horns as well as having the hooven legs of a buffalo with armored hooves. Instead of having dark blue or pale blue skin over its body, it was covered in a red and black ooze-like substance that pulsated and squirmed around erratically across its body. However, the most noticeable feature was the Namu's mouth wasn't beak-like or human-like. It was a gaping mouth with rows of sharp fangs and an elongated tongue. Toga and Carnage stared in horror and shock at what could only be the first of the Namu symbiotes. OF, so alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 7. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author's ultimate demon beast 65 and somebody on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.